Am I correct in noticing that we got an updated packet, but no email letting us know of an update? The update, Madam Chair, was the addition of um, the Commissioner Willie's amendment. Is that the one you're discussing or was there another piece? I don't know. I just noticed it via the, when I clicked, went to the I agenda page for the Zoom link since we didn't get. Was it the removal of the item from the consent agenda over no, to the- No, Commissioner Treese. It was the E2 added potential amendments. Yeah. Um, yes, the only addition, Madam Chair, was Commissioner Willies that came in uh, late yesterday from um, okay. uh, Tom and Tanya. That was- Okie dokie. Next yeah. time, we'll need to make sure that gets highlighted in the work session. Absolutely, Madam Chair. And we are ready to go when you are. So commissioners, uh, if you haven't already pulled down the latest packet, please do so. And that applies to our general public as well because sometimes we refer to things on pages. So um, Chair Herndon, sorry to interrupt you, but is this, I cannot start my video. I'm getting a, a notice. Oh, now I, uh, okay, now I got permission. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Once we see you, I'll gavel us in. It's Mich doing the same thing. Cannot start video, fail to start video camera. Please select another video camera. So, um, yeah, Commissioner Fi, it may be a setting. So, if you want to try to log out real quick and log back in, that may fix it. Uh -huh. Great. We can see all five of us then. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this fine Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. I'll turn it over to Clerk Moss. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Washington County Board of Commissioners also meeting as the Board of Directors for Clean Water Services and all other county service districts is now meeting this regular session, October 19th, 2021. Commissioner Willie? Here. Here. Commissioner Rogers? Here. Commissioner Fye? Vice Chair Treese? Here. And Chair Harrington? Here. Thank you. Uh, so for the members of our public, uh, just a couple of changes. Our agenda packet was updated uh, just in the last day to include an additional amendment related to item E2, which is under public hearings for ordinance number 878. In addition, we have pulled one item off of the consent agenda. That's item number 13, authorize public auction of surplus real property. We will uh, move that item under the action items as number three. Okay, is everybody square on the agenda? All righty. So next we'll move on to uh, the next items on our agenda. First, we have uh, our first public comment period. 
Uh, this is for anyone who wishes to address the commission for up to two minutes. Please note that if you are here to speak on uh, either of the items under our public hearings, that would be our supplemental budget, as well as Ordinance 878, those public hearings will come up in a few minutes. Uh, so now isn't the appropriate public comment time for, for that. Uh, Kevin, Board Clerk Moss, do we have anyone signed up? We do not have anyone signed up for this portion, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. We do have approximately 42 plus folks who have signed up to testify later in our agenda. Next, we'll move to our consent agenda, which uh, consists of 16 items. Two sets of minutes, one item under clean water services, one item under the sheriff's office, seven items under land use and transportation, one item under support services, three items under county administrative office, and one item under health and human services. What are the wishes of the commission? We have a motion from Commissioner Rogers. Do we have a second? Second from Commissioner Willie. All those in favor, please vote by raising your hand or saying aye. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously five to zero. Next, we'll move on to boards and commissions. This is an item to appoint George Marsh to the Agriculture One position on the Clean Water Services Advisory Commission, also known as CWAC. Matt Wellner has applied to continue his service on CWAC as the Builder slash Developer Two position. And Fatima Taha uh, is being advanced for the at-large district position on CWAC. Each of these terms would expire September 30th of 2025. What are the wishes of the commission with regard to these appointments? We have a motion from Commissioner Rogers, a second from Commissioner Willie. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye or raise your hands. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously five to zero. Thank you to uh, Mr. Marsh, Mr. Wellner, and Ms. Taha for your service. Uh, as we uh, learn or relearn every October in our annual gathering, either with the um, WEF Tech Conference or in Board of Director Training Bays, we are reminded how much work CWAC does for us in advising us on policies, uh, budget investments, and program practices. So thank you for that. Next, we'll move on to public hearings. Today, we have two different public hearings. For the first one, this is with regard to a resolution and order to adopt fiscal year 2021-22 supplemental budget items. These would be items uh, where we need to take action because they would increase the budget by over 10% in this current fiscal year. So with this, we'll have a staff report from the Washington County Chief Financial Officer, Jack Leong. Good morning, Chair Harrington. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, for the record, my name is Jack Leong, Chief Financial Officer for Washington County. As you are aware, Oregon local budget law allows for the modification of adopted budgets through the supplemental budget process. And that's what we have in front of you today. And we have a total of 17 items as listed in the agenda, as well as the exhibit A, uh, demonstrating each one of these adjustments. And I'll go, go over them one by one for the public's benefit. So for the first item under general government, we have the COVID-19 response and recovery fund, fund 155 and we're increasing revenue and expenditures. So this is uh, related with a theory of truing up to the ongoing grant uh, that we have both from the ARPA as well as from other Oregon uh, sources, including um, Oregon Department of Administrative Services, uh, OHA, Oregon Health Authority, and as well as FEMA uh, funding that we're anticipating to receive this year. So this is a quite 
a large adjustment to this set of budget. It's increasing the total budget for Fund 155 from roughly $50 million to uh, close to $100 million. The second item is related with local option administration, Fund 234. And we're taking, we're carrying forward the fund balance for $175,000 and then budgeting expenditures for $175,000. This is related with the WACA, the Washington County uh, Consolidated Communication Agency's financial contributions to the emergency communications project that continue into fiscal year 21-22. The third item is juvenile grants, and we're increasing revenue and expenditures appropriations for $120,046. This is related with additional state revenue realized um, that uh, was previously budgeted with a, a funding cut, but did not realize. Next item, number four, is juvenile conciliation services. We're increasing revenue and expenditure appropriations for $21,091. And this is also related with additional funding realized from an unrealized budget cut. Number five, we have a juvenile high risk prevention fund 228, and we're increasing revenue and expenditures um, both at the amount of $427,688, excuse me. And this are also related with additional uh, funding we realized from the state. Moving on to number six, this is where we have a series of, of uh, org units included under the road fund, land use and transportation, and we are increasing revenues by $2,697,637, expenditures appropriation by $15,455,433, and fund balance by $12,757,796. This is to recognize additional revenues received from the state for lost revenue allowed under the American Rescue Plan Act due to COVID and to carry forward the fund balance from prior fiscal year. Appropriate funds for prior, uh, priority projects, including concrete road repair, hydraulic side, slide repair, designed for full depth reclamation project, seismic study of uh, county bridges. Moving on to item number seven, we have statewide transportation improvement. Fund 209, and we are increasing revenues by 1,720,000 and uh, expenditures appropriations by 1,340,266 dollars. To recognize revenue from changes in TriMet's plan to disperse state transportation infrastructure fund, um, short STIF formula, and the fund grants from uh, ODOT, account for new discretionary state transportation infrastructure fund grants from ODOT and true up beginning fund balance altogether. Item number eight, major street transportation improvement program. And that is fund 362. And we're increasing fund balance as well as expenditure appropriations for $17,698,372 to carry forward the fund balance from prior fiscal year. Item number nine, under housing, health and human services, uh, first under public health fund 100, we're increasing revenues and expenditures appropriations by $4,092,997 to recognize additional revenues for new advancing health literacy, literacy grant. And then item number 10, under Health Share of Oregon Fund 195, we're increasing expenditure appropriations and the decreasing contingency by $4,500,000. For the Washington County Consolidated Communication Agency, WACA, tenants born site purchase and the capital improvement costs for the Center for Addictions, Triage and Treatment. Under item number 11, we have the aging services, Fund 198, and we're increasing both revenues and expenditure appropriations by $1,932,111 to recognize additional revenues for COVID-19 response through the American Re Rescue Plan Act. Item number 12, under Tri-County Risk Reserve Fund 207, we are increasing expenditure appropriations and decreasing contingency by $10,250,000 for the anticipated second facility purchase for the Center for Addiction, Addiction Triage and Treatment. Moving on to capital, under num item number 13, we have ITS Capital Projects Fund 354. We're increasing revenues by $275,063 expenditures appropriations by $1,159,082 and a fund balance by 
$884,019. This is to carry forward revenues and fund balance associated with the capital projects from prior fiscal year. The carry forward is due to projects from fiscal year 2020-21 for computer equipments that was not received prior to June 30th, 2021 due to COVID-19 supply chain delays. Item number 14, facilities capital projects fund 356. We're increasing revenues by $15 million, expenditures appropriations by 15 million, 549 and 293, and the fund balance by 500, uh, $549,293 for the anticipated facilities purchased for the Center for Addiction, Triage and Treatment, anticipating $10 million and 500,000 revenue from Tri-County Risk Reserve, the, 500, the remaining 549,292 $293 uh, fund balance carry forward is associated with the funding for general fund related capital projects underway in fiscal year 20-21 that are carried forward in fiscal year 21-22. Uh, These projects are included in Exhibit A. I wanted to highlight that the 10,500,000 is actually the revenue coming from the other two funds that was previously mentioned. Um, essentially, we're moving fund from the health funds into the facility capital project funds to facilitate the pro uh, property purchase. And then item number 15, general fund transfers. We're increasing expenditure appropriations by $2,984,753 and fund balance by $13 million in total to carry forward fund balance due to projects and transfers delayed from prior fiscal year and additional general fund savings realized in fiscal year 20-21. And number 16, this is related with the general fund contingency, and this is an increasing general fund contingency by $10,015,247. And this is a, basically a um, sum up from item nine and item 15 above. And this is a reflection of the amount of uh, uh, budget savings that we realized um, through fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 20 21. And then moving on to last item. Number 17, building equipment and replacement fund 232. And we're increasing expenditures appropriations by $1,357,431, decreasing contingency by 400,000 and carrying forward fund balance from prior fiscal year in the amount of $957,431. The fund balance carry forward is associated with funding for building equipment replacement capital projects underway in fiscal year 20-21 that are carried forward in fiscal year 21-22, including elevator upgrades, fire and security system replacements, jail walking freezer, animal shelter HVAC and roof, public service annex HVAC and emergency generators. So this 400,000 transfers from contingency is requested for the animal shelter HVAC project in particular, in order to address an expanded project scope resulting from the comprehensive review of the current equipment and anticipated needs. Uh, from the result in a higher cost estimate than, than, than anticipated. And that concludes the 17 items included in today's supplemental budget. I would like to mention that this is a bigger than usual supplemental budget than uh, that I have experienced in the past three years with Washington County. And, but I would like to point out that this is not a reflection of uh, uh, less than adequate planning as a budget adoption, but really it's a reflection of the fast paced uh, changing financial environment that we are in uh, today's uh, financial condition. With that, uh, I conclude my staff report. I will be happy to answer any questions and recommend your board to open a public hearing and uh, uh, consider adopting this supplemental budget adjustments. Commissioners, do you have any questions? No? Seeing none, I'd like to open a public hearing. Clerk Moss, do we have anyone who wishes to testify with regard to uh, this supplemental budget action? We do not have anyone signed up, Madam Chair. Would any members of the public like to provide testimony on this public hearing item? Seeing no hands, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Clerk Moss. With that, I'll close the public hearing. What are the wishes of the commission with regard to uh, this resolution in order to approve uh, these uh, supplemental budget items for fiscal year 21-22. There's a motion from Commissioner Treese. Do we have a second from Commissioner Rogers? Thank you. 
All those in favor, please vote by saying aye or raise your hand. Thank you, commissioners. Anyone opposed? The motion is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, just for everyone's benefit, uh, we do have an, another public hearing and then three action items. I know I have weighed in my mind uh, taking the three action items sooner, uh, but that would make members of our public community who have signed up for the next public hearing to wait. So we'll just proceed with things in order as we have them. So next we're going to move on to a third reading and second public hearing of Washington County Ordinance 878. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion to read the ordinance by title only. Do we have such a motion? Motion from Commissioner Fye, do we have a second? To read by title only, second from Commissioner Willie. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously, five to zero. Mr. Carr, could you please read this ordinance by title only? Thank you, Chair. Ordinance number 878, an ordinance to limit the access of tobacco flavored products, synthetic nicotine, and inhalant delivery systems to individuals under 21 years old and replacing ordinance 599. Thank you. Uh, we have Mira Samanto from Washington County Health and Human Services here for, oh, and Gwen Ashcom, thank you for a staff report on this item. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair Harrington. Good morning, Chair Harrington Commissioners. My name is Mira Samanto. I'm the Assistant Director for Health and Human Services. I'm here on behalf of Marnie Kyle, our director, um, who's out on a well-deserved vacation this week. Um, just waiting for the slide, there it is, perfect. And Gwen is here, um, Gwen Ashcombe is here with me, I'm um, available to answer questions as they come up, and then Tom Carr will also be helping me with a few of the slides towards the end. Next slide, please. So today, um, just a brief overview of what I'll be sharing in the staff report. Um, I will be providing a brief reminder about Senate Bill 587, um, the additional protective strategies that public health is recommending as part of the proposed ordinance 878, and then public health's overall recommendation for the board's consideration after summarizing the ordinance as it's currently proposed. Next slide, please. So Senate Bill 587, so this is the statewide tobacco retail licensure program that requires any retailer who sells a tobacco product, including vape products, must have a license to do so. The Oregon Health Authority can issue penalties for any violation, and this program requires an annual inspection for retailers. So through Senate Bill 587, local public health can administer and enforce this licensure program. So we can also provide public health outreach and education and add additional protective strategies, such as those that we are including in the proposed ordinance 878. And lastly, local public health can issue civil penalties. Next slide, please. So this slide, um, the protective strategies, what can we do? So as I mentioned, Senate Bill 587 allows local public health to add additional protective strategies. So we are recommending the, prohib the prohibition of price promotions and discounts and flavor restrictions. We know that the tobacco industry channels more advertising and discounts into neighborhoods with high proportions of residents who are people of color or have low socioeconomic status. The prevalence of tobacco makes it easier and cheaper for residents to continue and start using these addictive products. So by strengthening the tobacco retail licensure program, we have an opportunity to alter the systems and policies that perpetuate inequity by replacing them with new policies that purposely lead to health and equity. We can do this by prohibiting price promotions and discounts and by restricting flavors to establishments that only serve people who are 21 years or older. Next slide, please. So the proposed ordinance, Ordinance 878, um, this ordinance I wanna note has no change for purchase sites for non-flavored tobacco products. 
but the ordinance does add vape and synthetic nicotine to the definition. It reflects the legal purchasing age of 21 and updates other definitions. And most importantly, it restricts all flavored tobacco products. So those bubblegum, mint, menthol, mango flavors that are so attractive to our youth um, limits those to 21 and over establishments. So only traditional tobacco products, the non-flavored ones, would be remaining um, and available for purchase at retail establishments who serve those who are under 21. It also prohibits those price promotions and discounts in all establishments that sell tobacco or vape products. Next slide, please. So public health recommendation. Um, public health focus is promoting the health and well-being of all residents in Washington County. So to do that, we are recommending a public hearing today that would come next and consider adopting an ordinance that reflects the best practice in tobacco prevention. So today, your board can vote to approve this ordinance, 878, as proposed, reject the ordinance, consider one of the amendments to the ordinance and continue until November 2nd or continue to November 2nd. And I just want to see if there is a next slide. Okay, so Tom, I believe the few slides that you had added yesterday look like they're not in the slide deck. I know that Tom was hoping to uh, go next and kind of just provide a brief summary of the three different amendments that are in the board packet. So uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, the, this, the slides are actually in the packet that's online. So I'm gonna walk through them. The, the first one was about uh, Senate Bill 857. These respond to some questions I received uh, last week and over the weekend from various commissioners. Uh, there was a question about the importance of January 1st, 2022 and the effect, sorry, Chair. Can you give commissioners the opportunity to switch windows then uh, over to the presentation on their own machines or devices. It, if um, it's possible, I could share my screen and put this, those slides up. Kevin, may I share my screen? Yes, absolutely, Tom. You should be able to do that now. So Senate Bill 587. It, it, there's a provision in there that provides for the continuity of any local ordinance in effect on January 1st, 2022. Uh, Section 17A2 of the, of the bill provided that local uh, authorities could impose restrictions or standards for the sale of tobacco. Um, the, the significance of January 1st, 2022 is in Section 18, which says that anything that's enacted in effect by a local authority before that date will continue in effect. Uh, after that date, the state has the power to preempt local authority. So it's it's really up to the commission. If you want to rely on, on the state action, you can delay till after January 1st. The staff wanted to give you the opportunity to have the commission shape the rules here in Washington County. If you wish to do that, then those have to be in effect before January 1st. And so I also was asked to sort of talk a little bit about the various amendments. And I, they were proposed by individual commissioners. They're of course not on the table at all. So, and, and anybody can propose any amendment, but I'm gonna go through what's in the packet. The one that's labor, labor, labeled as Commissioner Fye's uh, amendment uh, makes some changes to language. Uh, it clarifies the rebuttal presumption of what constitutes a, flavor, a fl flavored product, removes the exemption for smoking cessation products, because it's included in another part. So it basically just cleans that up. It doesn't make any substantive change. It adds a definition of retailer uh, to use that phrase instead of person or entity. Uh, that's, that's just a clarification. Again, I don't think it makes a substantive change. Uh, in the definition of a tobacco product, it, it, it contains a clear uh, exemption for marijuana products. Uh, in prohibitions, it removes this, this prohibition on sale of synthetic nicotine products to minors. I'm not sure that was intended. I think the intent was that they would be prohibited, but there, there, there was a cross out that probably was, shouldn't be there. Uh, and it, but the big change is it prohibits the sale of flavored tobacco products regardless of age. And then the civil infraction section, it requires enforcement officers to issue tickets. That is, it changes a may to a shall. Uh, the one that's labeled uh, Chair Harrington's proposed amendment uh, 
it, it adds a finding, which the other ones don't, that's stating that tobacco is use is harmful regardless of the age of user, which will support the ordinance if, if the commission decides to ban flavored tobacco uh, completely. And it does prohibits the sale of flavored tobacco or flavored synthetic nicotine products regardless of age. And the third one, which is labeled a Commissioner Willie's proposed amendment, would apply only to flavored products used in vaping. So it does not apply to cigarettes. It would not apply to menthol. It would add an enhanced age verification requirement. It, is required, it would require that uh, at the point of sale, uh, uh, retailers use a scanner to verify identification. If the, it, they would still have to use a scanner. If the, the ID is not one that's subject to scanning, then it would be a personal verification. Uh, that is the end of the presentation. If the commission has any questions, we're happy to answer them. I have a question. I see that Commissioner Treese has her hand raised, so we'll go to her first. So, um, Mr. Carr, the, the amendment from Chair Harrington, is that an amendment to uh, Commissioner Fye's amendment? No, it's, it's separate. The origin for it is, as you heard back in our meeting in September, I supported the outcome that Commissioner Fi was proposing, but I wanted to make sure that we had language that had been vetted, both from our public health team as well as from our legal team. So Mr. Carr developed the material per my request and uh, as we went over it in our work session last week, this, what is marked on pages 175 through 178 uh, with my name at the top is, uh, accomplishes the objective that Commissioner Fi laid out, but does so in a way that is as written from our legal staff. Um, which you. is something I do because I want to make sure that any legislation we adopt, our legal staff is fully comfortable that they can uh, defend. So, and I'd like to hear the other questions. And then afterwards, Mr. Carr, I'd like to just look at those. Um, I can do it on my own here, but if you could put the amendments back on the screen, I'd appreciate it. Commissioner Willie, go ahead. And this is not discussion on the amendments. This is Q and A on the staff presentation. Right, exactly. Um, Tom, I I am kind of concerned a little bit about your classification of the term of retailer. So if you look at uh, item D, it says retailer, an entity located within or outside of the county that sells tobacco products to consumers in the county. So that's pretty broad when you incorporate it into, uh, as we go down to prohibitions, prohibited sales to persons under the age of 21, no retailer shall sell, distribute, and offer for sale. It sounds to me like we are prohibiting um, retail outlets outside of our county from selling products to residents of our county. That's how I read that definition. Don't think that's legal, but not a lawyer. Just sounds like we're taking a pretty broad swath at prohibition. Well, Commissioner Willie, that, that's not how I would read it uh, because it's, it doesn't say uh, consumers or residents of the county. It says consumers in the county. So it's anyone selling the product in the county, uh, which would be the nexus for jurisdiction anyway. So I, I think that it doesn't extend to people selling to Washington County residents outside of the county. Well, so why do we even have an entity located within or outside of the county when we're only dealing with retailers within our county? So why do we even refer to outside of the county? I, I, I did not draft this, Commissioner Willie, and I'm not <laughs> sure why that's there. I, I, I think it's intended to be, to be comprehensive uh, and 
I don't think you can do mail order sales, but perhaps it's intended to get to that. So, okay, Your I would question like- question is on the Commissioner Fi amendment, correct? Sorry. That is correct, that's correct. Um, well, and so, you know, that's another question. Are we truly restricting catalog sales from residents within the county? I mean, wow, that's pretty comprehensive. So, I want that, if that's the case, I want everybody to know the full intended consequence of that terminology. So Mr. Carr, at what point are we moving from questions about the staff presentation and over to questions on amendments that are merely published in the packet, but not on the table? Um, I, I, I think that you can ask questions about the amendments because that's, they were part of the, the staff presentation. I just asked the, the commissioners to restrict from um, lot, uh, commenting opining. or you know, opining, uh, this should be questions. We'll have plenty of time for opining later. And yeah, I just want to make sure that we have the opportunity to hear from our public as well. I don't have a problem with that either, Chair. I realize we have at least 42 people in the queue. So I would say, yeah, let's hit the pause button, but I just want to, I'm making these comments and those other concerns I have about this that before we consider a motion to amend and that process, we need to make sure we have clarity on what it is the motion to amend is. So just because we have three amendments in the packet doesn't mean we're going to actually be making a motion for each of those amendments. Commissioner Rogers, you have questions on the staff report. Yes, I do. And, and thanks, Commissioner Willie. I had a similar uh, question that you did. Um, it, it's not real clear. And I understand, Tom, you didn't draft that language, but that, that is an issue that it's not clear in my mind. The question I have, it doesn't have anything to do with three amendments, but with the questions I asked the last time, which I still haven't got an answer to. Is there in any of these uh, various, uh, I guess, suggested uh, changes, a prohibition against the possession and use. That to me is a central question in all of this. Is Washington County in any way going to monitor the use or possession? Because that, that's a significant uh, enforcement issue. If someone goes over into another county and buys product and comes back and uses them, is that a what kind of an offense is it? Uh, and not using but having mere possession is that an infraction as well? So I'll leave it at that. But I certainly like that uh, answer. And I can answer. Uh, there's nothing in here that regulates the use or possession. It's all pointed to the sale and distribution. So your question is answered similar to what it was at work session last Tuesday. Are there any other questions on the staff report? Seeing none, do we have a motion to read ordinance 878 by title only? Matt, Madam Chair, you have completed that motion oh. already. Thank you. That's right, because we had the staff report. <laughs> Thanks very much, Clerk Moss. Okay, seeing none, uh, or moving on then, I need to open a public hearing on ordinance number 878. Clerk Moss. All right, first up, Madam Chair, we have State Representative Rachel Prusak. Representative Prusak, please go ahead for up to two minutes. Good morning, commissioners. I hope you can hear me. Great. Thank you for this conversation today. My name is Rachel Prusak, and I serve as one of the state representatives serving parts of Washington County. I'm also the chair of the House Health Care Committee, and I advocated for the policy on tobacco retail license. And I'm beyond thankful for the continued work this commission is willing to do. I care about this issue deeply because I'm not just a state representative. I'm a family nurse practitioner. 
I'm tired of seeing my patients, too often the working poor, who are targeted by big tobacco in their youth, die premature and painful deaths because of the impacts of tobacco. This weighs on me every day. And it also ultimately weighs on the state. Currently, the Oregon Health Plan spends millions a year just treating tobacco-related illness. Meanwhile, the big tobacco industry is profiting at unprecedented rates. And we must not continue to allow tobacco and vape shops to sell to those under 21. Even as we tout a dwindling rate of teenage cigarette smoking, falling from 25% of teens to just 5% in 20 years, smokeless tobacco and electronic cigarette use is on the rise, and a quarter of all teens use tobacco in one way or another. How did we get here? How did we allow large tobacco companies to entangle young people in a dangerous habit that can cost them their lives? How did we miss the signs? Well, we didn't. The truth is we've known the dangers in the, since the invention of the first widely produced e-cigarette in 2003, when studies proved that smokeless tobacco is just as dangerous as traditional cigarettes and use of smokeless tobacco starts at an earlier age and can lead to a higher than normal rate of cigarette smoking later in life. We even knew that smokeless tobacco use can actually create a stronger addiction that is harder for kids to kick later in life. These findings haven't changed. As many as 60% of 10th graders have reported that getting an e-cigarette or e-cigarette fluid was easy and underage purchases of an e-cigarette is 35% less likely to result in an ID check. More than 17% of high school e-cigarette users have admitted they got their e-cigarette or their fluid or their e-cigarette from a vape shop in the last month. And more than half admit to getting an e-cigarette from a friend who also bought under 21. Thank, Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Sorry. Madam Representative. With, um, with this many people signed up, we're going to have to be a little unforgiving on the two minute uh, duration, but thank you, Representative Prusak for joining us today. Who's next, Clerk Moss? Uh, next is Ho Chi Zen. Can you hear us? And my apologies if I butchered your name. Yeah, Ho Chi Zen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Please go ahead. ahead. Yeah, thank you. So my name is Hong Chung Zhao. Uh, I am the president of Oregon Chinese Coalition. But today I'm speaking on my own behalf. I want to tell teens that smoking that a matter is a cigarette was flavor product. It's more like a lifestyle to most of you. I know it's because I was smoking myself years ago, but this lifestyle comes with a dear price that you may have to pay we all know sometimes we still like, but most people may underestimate the impact from the addiction. I started to smoke, not for lifestyle, but more for a practical purpose, helping me concentrate when writing for academic publications. I was a very light smoker, only smoking when I was writing. I decided to quit when, I, my, when my elder son was going to, to be born. That was 10 years after I started. Because I was not a heavy smoker, it was not that difficult to quit smoking. I guess going to be a father made me a super one. But I didn't realize the habit of putting something into my mouth was that hard to get rid of. That was, there were so many times I put my fingers close to my mouth, thinking of cigarettes on my fingers. That competition was so strong that I had to put something in my mouth, sometimes a ballpen, most of the time for the sake of the companies. It was a color of my t-shirt. I couldn't stop doing it for the next 20 years. In those years, every single one of my t-shirts had broken colors. It's not a matter of running almost more than 100 t-shirts. It's about a frustration about yourself and an anger also towards your loved ones. Now, when I look back at the journey, I would say it was totally not worth starting it at the first place. That's a short. I wish I could have spent some time on Mr. 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 Sal, thank, yes. thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Next up, Madam Chair, we have uh, Connie. Connie, can you please go ahead? Sure, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Good morning, Chair Harrington and Board. My name is Connie Rawmakers, and I support the Tobacco Ordinance 878. On behalf of our community coalition, Tiger Turns the Tide, and our student-led group of over 60 members, which stands for Stop Tiger, Underage Drinking and Drugs, we strongly support the Board of Commissioners in adopting Ordinance 878, which is an ordinance to limit the access of tobacco, flavored products, synthetic nicotine, and inhalant delivery systems to individuals under 21 years of age. This ordinance is in line with best practices in tobacco prevention, decreased youth access, initiation, and use. Similar ordinances have been adopted by several states and counties across the nation and have been proven to be effective. Tiger Turns a Tide has been in existence since 1984, and it is our mission to promote a safe and healthy community in Tiger by reducing alcohol, tobacco, and other drug-related problems through prevention and education. It is our goal to help our youth reach their full potential by staying healthy and drug-free. Tobacco use among our teens and the youth in our schools continue to increase. We have several students from Tigard High write letters to you and hopefully you have received them. They know and see how tobacco use is prevalent among their peers and is often done in the bathrooms during school hours. The proposed ordinance is the next logical step in the fight against the tobacco industry's influence on our youth, the negative impact in our communities, and the adverse health effects of, the da of this dangerous product. We look forward to watching the Board of Commissioners leadership in tobacco prevention by adopting Ordinance 878. Thank you for this opportunity to help our youth. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Next up, we have Christopher Friera. Christopher, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you to the committee for taking the time to review my testimony. My name is Christopher Ferreira and I represent the Oregon Vapor Trade Association. The Oregon Vapor Trade Association does not support any amendments to Ordinance 878. The science is clear. Smoking kills an estimated 480,000 Americans each and every year. Vaping has been shown to be 95% safer than smoking and has been cited as, quote, significantly less harmful by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, the American Cancer Society, and the US Food and Drug Administration. Flavors are the reason for a smoker's success in quitting. Over 72% of adults who quit smoking using a vapor product did so with a flavored vapor product. Furthermore, 83.2% of those adults maintain their cessation from combustible tobacco with said flavors. Scientific studies have proved that flavor bans on vapor products have a multitude of unintended consequences. A study at Yale University examined the casual impact of access to vapor products on teen smoking and found that after such bans are implemented, that there is a quote, statistically significant increase in combustible tobacco smoking rates among 12 to 17 year olds. The Oregon Vapor Trade Association asks you not to ban flavored vapor products. Flavored vaping products represent over 90% of our association's member sales. Vapor businesses create jobs and contribute to local budgets through associated taxes. If Ordinance 878 passes with the addendums to ban all flavors, these jobs and associated taxes will be lost, decreasing any net gain revenues. The state of Oregon has already implemented a high tax on vapor products to curb youth use. There is also a licensure program for tobacco retailers that starts January 1st, 2022. This coupled with the passing of HB 2261, which prohibits remote sales of inhalant delivery systems should do a great service to stop the youth from using tobacco products. The Oregon Vapor Trade Association wishes to express to this committee that these programs are not yet implemented and that their implied benefit has not yet been felt. Rushing to impose, okay, thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. All right, next up, Madam Chair, we have Ron Squires. Ron, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Ron Squires. I'm the president of Rich and Ryan, a Harbor wholesale company. We have three warehouses that sell grocery, beverages, snacks, deli food, and tobacco and vape to convenience stores, colleges, gift shops, et cetera. We're in the middle of a pandemic that impacts our business every day. This week already, we have had a team member get his catalytic converter stolen off his vehicle during the day while he was working. This is the fourth time it has happened since, the June, of, since June of this year. We have a homeless caravan of trailers and motorhomes across the street that is posted as a no parking zone, leaving no parking for our team members. 
We need help with these type of issues before we look at banning products that are legal to sell to adult consumers. Since I last testified to this board a few weeks ago, I've had numerous inquiries from store owners asking me where they can buy a store that borders Washington County. I feel bad for your constituents who would be impacted by a flavor ban. These people are not big tobacco or lobbyists for the vape industry. They are trying to survive a pandemic and a worsening supply chain that will affect all of us in the next year. You must be 21 years old to purchase alcohol, tobacco, and vape. Have any of the board members looked to see how well your constituents are doing in sting operations on tobacco and vape? Today's youth are not getting tobacco and vape from your local convenience stores. It's friends and family. Why do we not have penalties and fines for people who supply today's youth with tobacco and vape? Why not a minor in possession as we do as out in alcohol, excuse me. There are many flavors of vodka and whiskey. Adults like flavors. Here is a list of the flavors of marijuana that I found in Washington County. Orange creamsicle, lemon kush, nectarine squeeze, forbidden fruit, Tropicana punch, wedding cake, strawberry guava. Washington County could be the first county in the nation to be illegal to sell or buy strawberry flavored cigar that would be able to put. Thank you, Ron. Next up, we have Haley Smith. Haley, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Haley Smith. I am a Beaverton resident and I am in full support of Ordinance 878. As a parent of two children under the age of seven, I look forward to watching my family live a long and healthy life. It's terrifying to think that within the next few years, the likelihood of my first grader being exposed to e-cigarettes is extremely high, especially when flavors like bubble gum or cotton candy or fruit punch are what is being marketed to our youth. I am convinced that these flavor, I am not convinced, excuse me, that these flavored products contribute to tobacco cessation, and I believe that they will only lead to more nicotine addiction among our children. I told my six and a half year old son that I would be providing testimony today, and we proceeded to have a conversation about why these tobacco flavors are harmful. By the end of our talk, he asked, well, can I try the kid version of the e-cigarette? Now my job is to make sure he understands that a kid version does not exist. Um, even though these exciting flavors do, the line between what is suitable for children and what is suitable for adults has been completely blurred. As a parent, I am asking for your help. Help unblur this line. I cannot be with my children every minute of every, of every day. And I understand that they will make their own decisions regarding their health, regardless of how we guide them. But please help our children make healthy choices by eliminating these tempting tobacco flavors that offer zero benefits. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you, Haley. Next up uh, is Kong Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chair Commissioner and, uh, and other commissioners. I'm Chong Sullivan, President of Okegro, uh, Korean American Grocery Retailer of Oregon, and representing 163 small business owners, employing 326 Oregonian in all four Washington County districts. During the last hearing, I sent a letter from Washington County retailers in opposition to Ordinance A78. I want to make sure you got this email. Kegor is opposed to Ordinance A78 because it will be devastating to our business. After a lady shattering COVID environment of 18 months, our store rely on the profit of tobacco sales to stay in business. Mental cigarettes and wintergreen and mint shoes are important to our business. 90% of our store owners are immigrants. They believe in American dream and work tirelessly day in and day out. We pay our taxes, uh, our employees. Not only will our members see the dramatic decrease in illegal sales of tobacco, but we'll also lose additional sales on things like uh, water, gas, pop, and candy. Tobacco customer comes to our store every day, every other day, and spend about $15 on other items each time. For our average Kagura store, losing flavored tobacco sales means losing $260,000 in annual sales to neighboring counties and Washington State. This will be devastating our stores, our essential business, uh, and provide provide place for food and many county residents who on, on your walk in the neighborhood. The audience will destroy our member stores, many uh, will, will close and the employee will be laid off. This is not a time for force my uh, members out of their business when they have already been struggling and going through so much. You are messing with their livelihood. Um, what they fought so hard to maintain and grow. Uh, this un unfairly direct business away from my Kegel members stores. Our members have a high, uh, high compliance in selling tobacco to adults. 
21 and older and take our responsibility to check ID very seriously. These consumers are our community and our family. I urge you to oppose a uh, audience A78, which unfairly targets essential business by banning the sale of a flavored tobacco hey, product. Thank we you, Mr. Salvin. Next up, Madam Chair, we have Kun Zhang. Kun, can you hear us? Uh, Kua Zhang, can you hear us? There you go. Please go ahead. Okay, we'll work with him. We'll move on to the next one, Madam Chair. Uh, it's... All right, uh, Mir Ahmed, can you can you hear us? When you're on, Med. Yes, I'm speaking on air. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. please go ahead. Hello, good morning, everybody. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Please go ahead. Could you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Yes, my name is Bonir Ahmed. Our store is uh, located uh, in 5065 Southwest Shosari Road. So we are uh, have to, we want to be help from uh, Commissioner's desk because of uh, our store uh, located in Washington County, and uh, uh, the other store is uh, 76 in uh, Matloma, Matloma County. So please don't ban uh, flavor cigarette. Otherwise, the customer go to all other stores and they buy from there, and we lose our customer for the gas and our other stuff too. So please do help us. And otherwise, uh, you know, over we can pay for over implies uh, wages because very, very hard for us because we are a small business. So please help to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next uh, chair is Cheese uh, Yu Lam. Can you hear us? Um, yes. <clears throat> okay, I sign up for the five minutes testimony. Do we have such a thing? It, uh, if your comments are related to the ordinance 878, anything on tobacco products or e-cigarettes, it would be appropriate under this time. Okay, thank you. So I fully advocate for ordinance 7, uh, 787. Uh, here are my reasons. So uh, when medical marijuana um, passed a law in 2014, we have a 1,000 feet buffer from all schools. However, um, our e-cigarette products and tobacco are promoted heavily by the tobacco industry right in the heart of your neighborhood, in convenience stores and gas stations. And um, in Oregon alone, there's a uh, hundred million budget from tobacco industry to promote such products, which are displayed 3.5 uh, 3 feet from ground, which are way below the eye level of an average adult. And they're also encouraged and paid to be displayed at the cashier registry and also uh, sew together with bundles with other uh, common items for this age group, like, like Twinkies and, and gum and uh, candies. So by removing, um, by re restrict, you know, restricting the sale to such age group will less the attraction and, and definitely sorting the marketing effort from uh, the tobacco industry. <clears throat> also, um, so FDA last week also approved the first authorization of um, the e-cigarette called um, Views Solo, which is the number two leading brand in the market right now. I think that's definitely a misleading signal to our youth today. Um, maybe uh, assuming that e-cigarettes are somehow safer. E-cigarettes contain nicotine and other mixed chemicals actually in the form of a nicotine salt, which can allow higher concentration. And, and it's definitely a alternative and more dangerous tobacco product and all tobacco products are harmful. And um, this 6.09 billion business in America is growing at 27.3%, uh, attracting youth consumers who they're cultivating into lifelong smokers. And as adults, we, um, by supporting this uh, ornament, we're sending a message to children of what our standing in this is to prohibit the sale and protecting our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lam. Next, Madam Chair, we have Matthew Bogle. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. can. Perfect. Thank you. So my name is Matthew Bogle. Uh, I'm employed at a store in District 2. We're a small business with four employees. It's our only location, and I'm the most junior member of the staff. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for the chance uh, to speak at this meeting this morning. Secondly, I would ask that you all oppose Ordinance 878, 
as something like this could very well cost me my job. Uh, at a time when so much has become uncertain, I was lucky enough to retain my job throughout the pandemic because we are considered essential employees. However, a sweeping ban like this could very well lead to a large enough deficit in revenue that I would find myself unemployed, uh, which means this would likely broadly affect many other small businesses in our community. Third, these prohibitions always have unintended consequences. Given the two most famous examples being alcohol in the 20s and more recently cannabis, we know that people still find ways to receive prohibited product and that black market criminal elements stand to profit, especially since they will most likely sell to anyone regardless of age. While at our store, we have acquired an electronic ID scanner to make sure we are only selling to adults over the age of 21 with a valid ID. As far as I'm aware, we were not required to do this. We take our responsibility of keeping tobacco away from underage citizens very seriously, and we take measures like this to prove it. So once again, I urge all of you to oppose Ordinance 878 as the potential for far-reaching, unintended consequences is just too great. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Madam Chair, we have Debbie Taylor. Debbie, can you hear us? Can you unmute, Debbie? If you're dialing in by phone, Debbie, it is star six to unmute. Okay, Debbie, we'll come. There you go. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, so my name is Debbie Taylor, and I work in Beaverton at a cigar and pipe tobacco store. And forgive me, I am very nervous of public speaking, but it is important to tell you that I don't agree with the flavor and pipe ban. Uh, you know, so just as Oregon sells marijuana and just as Oregon sells alcohol, we too sell products in a responsible way to grown adults and adults like choices. I am sure that some sneaky teenagers get a hold of marijuana and alcohol, and yet I don't blame the dispensaries or the liquor stores. That's not how they're getting it. Also, I would like to add that we have lost a lot of customers over the years to internet shopping as prices go up and such. And I fear a ban will drive even more people to the internet. In my opinion, the risks of a ban do not outweigh the benefits. I like my job and I'd like to keep it. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Next up, Madam Chair, we have Jonathan Yu. Jonathan, can you hear us? Can you unmute, Jonathan? There we right. go. Good morning, go. everybody. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I want to thank you for your time. Please ban 870 eight because our business has taken a big beating. And I'm going to bulletproof the uh, bullet line. There's only going to be four items. So I'm going to make it very brief. Number one, um, ever since COVID, our business has been negatively impacted. And we are, even though we're essential, it's still not enough. Second thing is, because of business owner, um, I take this ID checking very, very seriously because you guys send out your sting operation people to do it. And like I said, even just on the illegal sale of tobacco, I also check IDs on energy drinks too because parents are very concerned about being able, why are the kids getting stuff like this? So I check all that also too. So I just want to let you know, as a responsible business owner, I do care about the community, but. At the same time, please do not uh, uh, take my business away. And also, uh, bullet item number three is we have regular customers who come to our place. If these regulars are go away, I will have no business to operate anymore. And lastly, in regards to COVID, yes, it has overly affected of our sales. Half of my revenue is gone. And on top of this, as a September 9th, I lost my mom to COVID in Pennsylvania, even though she was uh, vaccinated. So these are very difficult times. So in conclusion, I want to thank you for your time. And I ask you, please do not pass this ordinance because it will not only impact me, but a lot of small businesses that depend on this. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Laddie Singh. Laddie, can you hear us? Can you unmute, Laddie? All right, we will move on to the next one, Madam Chair, and come back. Uh, next is Ryan Raphael. Ryan, can you hear us? 
Yes. Can you- yes, we can. Please go ahead. Uh, I want to say thank you for your time today. Um, uh, my name is Ryan. I'm a vape shop order, uh, owner, and I oppose Ordinance 878. The basis of this ordinance, as we see, it's to eliminate youth access to vaping. But I want to say this. We know that alcohol is toxic. It comes in different flavors, size, and quantities. 95,000 deaths are related to alcohol each year, according to NIWA.gov. However, on the contrary, the vapes has helped tens of thousands of adult smokers kick their habits on cigarettes. However, since the vape industry, quote unquote, just the vape industry does not have the strong lobby groups like the alcohol industry, it makes it an easy target to hit on. So what we're doing is penalizing the weak and rewarding the lobbyists. This is not freedom to make adult smokers switch back to cigarettes. This is not freedom to open a black market to flavor tobacco products. If kids really want something, they will find a way to get it, no matter the restrictions that be in place. That's why you still see kids having substance abuse and getting their hands on marijuana and so what, even though it's illegal. So to make a perfect society, society will never be perfect and an outright ban will not help this as alcohol was under prohibition did not help. As a vape shop owner, we do not have other sources of revenue to offset the economic impact of having a ban. We, are, we don't have a gas station or convenience store to even supplement our income. We make sure that customers only 21 and over can enter our facility, view and purchase our products. So what this does is only adults can view, see products, and know the idea of these different products when they enter our facility. Um, and to say that alcohol and marijuana shops can stay open, but vape shops have to close their doors, in my opinion, makes no sense. In addition to that, we use very strict uh, ID uh, mechanisms to make sure that when a customer does come in with an ID, we do verify that ID. So please make a decision that please uh, make, make a good decision because this is not only dictating lives of products helping smokers, but can keep food from my family's mouth. So I urge you not to bring pro- prohibition back because it hasn't Thank helped. You. Next, Madam Chair, we have Jennifer McElway. Jennifer, can you hear us? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, good morning, Chair Harrington and commissioners. My name is Jennifer McElravey. And I'm here today on behalf of the Washington County Public Health Advisory Council. I'm also a pharmacist and I'm a mother of three teenagers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning in support of Ordinance 878, which would restrict the sale of all flavored tobacco products to 21 and over establishments and prohibit price promotions and discounts. As the chair of the Washington County Public Health Advisory Council, We have previously submitted our support of Ordinance 878 and are here today to continue to encourage the board to continue to prioritize youth tobacco prevention by adopting the amendment to Ordinance 878 proposed by Commissioner Fye, which would ban the sale of flavored tobacco and synthetic nicotine products in the county. Youth tobacco use is increasing in Washington County and the tobacco industry continues to use marketing strategies that target children. The advent of new products such as flavored e-cigarettes and synthetic nicotine has contributed to that rise. By adopting the proposed amendment, Washington County would join 274 other US jurisdictions that have enabled, enacted your restrictions on flavored tobacco sales and would set the standard for the state. This type of policy action is not new in helping to address youth tobacco use. While data is still emerging on the impact of flavored tobacco sale restrictions, The data that is available indicates that strong laws can be easily implemented and can help reduce youth access to and use of tobacco by removing from store shelves the products that are most attractive to youth and the products that youth use most often. Adoption of this ordinance with the amendment proposed would provide another tool for Washington County to continue addressing youth tobacco, tobacco access. On behalf of the Washington County Public Health Advisory Council, please, pass this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Madam Chair, we have Sahid Anwar. Sahid, can you hear us? Mr. Anwar, can you unmute? Can you hear me now? Good morning. Yes, yes, thank you. Well, thank you so very much, commissioners, for giving me an opportunity to give a little testimony about what we have on the agenda. Just to give you a background, I currently own two retail stores. They're not gas stations, they're just convenience stores. And one has been around for 11 years. 
and the other one I just opened a month ago. So now I'm in a cash 22 situation. So I got one store operating, the other store just opened, barely struggling to stay above the water. And then uh, I am smoker myself, but that was not by choice. My family is against, and none of my family members from my mother's or father's side smoke. But unfortunately, I joined Pakistan Air Force when I was young and had a little issue with the nausea. So my instructor, instructor, sorry, puts me on smoking to just offset that strong sense of aviation fuel. So since then, I smoked, but after e-cigarettes came along, I switched over to blue. I'm sure everybody's aware of that. How long has it been? So that did help me out in quitting it. But what I'm saying is that we, as a country, a state, county, are enforcing regulations every day so that teens cannot have access to tobacco product. I just got a data from FDA in Washington County from 2009 to 2021, our compliance rate of retailers is 99%, which Thank shows you. to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Anwar. Next up, we have Ray Dufault. Ray, can you hear us? Can you unmute Ray? Yes. There you go. Please go ahead. Okay. I work at a convenience store. I have for eight years. And uh, we check IDs on, on everybody that comes in. Uh, and, you know, some people that can do come in, don't have their ID. And they say, oh, I left it in the car. I said, well, go get it. I got to see ID. They never come back in. So the people, you know, are selling to undage people. I understand that. But then again, the people that are 21 and older uh, should have, you know, the right to, to purchase it. But uh, when they ban it, that means my job. And uh, so, you know, if I lose my job, what do I do? I check everybody. In fact, I've had people come in and give me a card that said, thank you for checking IDs. Uh, so uh, I, check, I, you know, I check on everybody. It's just the way that it is. But people come in. I'm 81 years old. I'm not no young kid. And I quit smoking nine years ago. It was just cold turkey. And uh, but I was lucky and I, I I just quit, you know, that was it for me. I'd quit many times before that all my life. But now I haven't smoked, even wanted a cigarette, I haven't cheated. But uh, then I see people come in the store and they're all you know, in their forties and fifties. Not gonna stop them from buying, and some of them are buying the vape products. They say that helps them a lot. Took them off the nicotine, off the cigarettes. So, and I need my job. And if I lose my job, what am I supposed to do? I'm 81 years old. Uh, I just don't understand what's going on here. And uh, I enforce it. The people I work with enforce us checking IDs. And uh, we have a lot, a lot of you know family business that comes in and uh they would be coming back if they thought we were you know doing something wrong but i want to thank you for your time i appreciate it all right thank, thank you, you mr oh well, next we have christina bodmar christina yes hi can you hear me yes we yep. can please go ahead thank you chair harrington and members of the county commission my name is christina bodmar i'm the oregon government relations director for the american heart association joining you again today in support of Ordinance 878 with amendment. I'm not going to repeat the science that I mentioned last time. Instead, I'm going to share some data recently from Multnomah County, who has the longest tobacco retail licensure program in our state. Um, they recently finished their um, 2018 to 2020 uh, minimum sales age inspections and found that the establishments that are 21 and over had some of the worst compliance rates for underage sales. 25%, that's one in four of bars and restaurants sold to minors, 26% of one in four of liquor stores sold to minors, 
and 55%, that is over half of tobacco shops sold to minors. Also concerning from this data is the inspection failure rate of establishments that are closest to schools. Of their entire program of the 256 failed inspections in Multnomah County, 225 occurred within 2000 feet of a school. That is 88% of all documented sales to minors occurring within 2000 feet of a school, which is less, barely over a third of a mile. In addition to the egregious flavors that we see in vapes, we cannot forget that mint and menthol flavored tobacco are heavily marketed to kids, African-Americans and our Latinx communities. Nearly two thirds of high school students who use cigarettes use mint or menthol flavors. In the past few weeks, you've heard testimony and received letters from pediatricians, doctors, nurses, youth addiction services programs, state legislators, parents, youth, community health clinics, and nonprofit health organizations all asking you to take a stand and choose protecting kids over profits. The American Heart Association once again urges your support of Ordinance 878 with amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Bob Barman. Bob, can you hear us? Yes, I can. My name's Bob Barman, and I am the owner of the Marine Allen Chevron. Uh, I I have two positions. Number one, if you are going to approve something, I support uh, either uh, opposition or uh, the Wiley Amendment. And the reason is, is um, if you just Google, there's 20 liquor stores in Washington County, 10 Dotties, 8 Richards, and just Deedees. Those are all, um, as the current amendment is done, would be allowed to sell all these products. I have Dotties right in my parking lot. And I also have a liquor store in my parking lot. So how is that going to get to the core issue that you're trying to do, which is get rid of flavored inhalant systems? What you have is a very uh, open system with, in Washington County where all the products could be bought. It just couldn't be bought at our business. So then I say, well, you, you realize you made an error. Uh-oh, January 1, you can't make an amendment. So effectively what you've done if you don't get this right, is after January 1, you've had us as sitting ducks. So the Wiley Amendment is important because it sits there and says, we're not going to allow this anywhere. And that's a fair, that, that at least everyone's on the same playing field. I'll never take a backseat to anti-smoking. I was a, a eight-year board member on the school board in Lake Oswego. I've had youth all the way to 2019. I understand your interest in this policy issue, but you've got to have it on a fair and balanced way. So my suggestion is that Commissioner Wiley has hit it the nail on the head, restrict it everywhere if you're going to restrict it. And number two, uh, if you're not going to if you're not going to restrict, and I can understand that, you have the issues around the surrounding counties. So I just feel your existing your existing thank, issue. Thank, thank you, Mr. Barman. Next, we have Tad Truex. Tad, can you hear us? Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can. Uh, thank you. Thank you, commissioners. After uh, listening to the amount of discussion on this topic, I decided to do what a typical teenager would, who wished to experiment with nicotine would do. So the first thing I did, like most teenagers, I used my phone to find a product that would be appealing. I was able to find a bright yellow strawberry banana flavored vapor device for $7.99, which included shipping, that I purchased with no identification. Uh, I didn't even have to enter a birthday. I used a prepaid credit card number and an email address, and that was it. I received the device a couple days later in the mail in a nondescript envelope, ironically from the state of California, which I believe is a flavor ban state. It is my belief a large part of the reason that our retailers have such a high compliance rate is that underage consumers want products often not sold at many of these stores or deal with the embarrassment of being asked for ID or perhaps seeing someone else they know. In other words, the majority of underage purchasing aren't shopping there because it is quite honestly too much trouble. 
this flavor ban proposal will result in damaging retailers as well as inconvenience adult men and women who live here and wish to purchase these approved legal products from licensed retailers. I would ask that each of you consider what you as an underage consumer would buy and how would you go about acquiring it. That is why I support Commissioner Willie's amendment to address youth access without harming legal adult consumption. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rex. Next, we have Sean Kennedy. Sean, can you hear us? I have to hit star six on your phone. Can you, here you go. There we go. Uh, thank you very much for hearing me today. Um, I've, in the in the wake of several amendments being proposed, as I'm not 100% sure where I'm going to be testifying, I had some prepared testimony, but let me just go with what I had regarding the original ordinance. And um, I'm Sean Kennedy. I'm a resident of Washington County. I'm also a, an employee of Doyle Sheehan. We're a distributor. We distribute many of the products that would be covered by this ban. Um, there's a couple of real uh, flaws with this ordinance, I believe. If your goal is to improve uh, the, the outcomes for people who uh, traditionally use tobacco, uh, we decrease tobacco morbidity, you, you're really missing the boat if we don't uh, exempt uh, products that are certified by the FDA to be a reduced harm product. Uh, there are many public health uh, leaders who also feel this way, including Cliff Douglas. He's the formerly the vice president of tobacco control for the American Cancer Society. He has stated that uh, differential regulations favoring reduced harm products are one of the ways that we can reduce tobacco morbidity. Uh, Sweden, for example, has done this for years uh, and they have the lowest tobacco morbidity rate among men in all the European nations by a dramatic amount. And they, like, in this case, it's snus that they favor, which has been demonstrated. In fact, the FDA is uh, actually certified as a reduced harm product. So any ordinance of this sort that doesn't include uh, exemptions for reduced harm products isn't actually doing what's best for current tobacco users. Um, additionally, I believe that uh, in a couple of amendments could in include the cannabis uh, industry in terms of devices used for cannabis use. Uh, specifically, Commissioner Willies seems to include any vaping device, including those that uh, Inc are intended for cannabis use. And I thank, encourage thank, you to- Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Careful. Next, we have Angela Murther Smothers. I apologize on that. Angela, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Thank you, commissioners, for your time. My name is Angela Smolders, and I am both a mother and the owner of a liquor store here in Washington County. I am still in opposition of Ordinance 878 in its original form. I am, however, in support of Commissioner Willie's proposed amendment as a way to address youth access without infringing on responsible adult consumer choice. Commissioner Willie's proposal is also in accordance with current and upcoming laws and programs. Senate Bill 587, which requires retailers to get a license to sell tobacco products and e-cigs, will go into effect in January 2022. Ms. Banks, director of the OHA, stated that this licensing program will reduce youth access to commercial tobacco and hold retailers accountable if they make illegal sales. The CDC and U.S. Surgeon General also fully support this program's ability to reduce youth tobacco use. Let's see the benefits from this highly endorsed bill before we implement even more authoritarian policies. Additionally, the ORS Chapter 167, Section 765 requires that tobacco products or inhalant delivery systems may not be in a location in the store where they are accessible by store customers without assistance from a store employee. My staff has responsible seller training upon hire and regular refreshers. Our house policy is to ID anyone who looks under 30. We'll be happy to abide by an enhanced age verification protocol as we do not want to sell to minors. We are not the people who are supplying tobacco to underage users. The only thing wrong my team has done is make the decision to work in Washington County where their livelihoods are at risk due to an inefficacious ban. We know from history that a flat out prohibition will not work. Ordinance 878 in its original form will not limit youth access to tobacco products, infringes on the adult consumer's right to choose, 
will lead to a rise in black market crime, unfairly targets minorities, and puts additional strain on our law enforcement officers. Therefore, I support Commissioner Willie's amendment as a responsible and effective proposal in curbing youth access to tobacco without undue hardship on thank, local business. Thank you, Angela. Next is Cody Payne. Cody, can you hear us? Hello, and thank you for having me today. My name is Cody Payne, and I'm with Doyle Sheehan, which is a small family owned distribution company. We distribute tobacco products and smoking accessories to several hundred retail locations around the state of Oregon, including stores in Washington County. I oppose this ban on flavored tobacco products and inhalant delivery systems for several reasons. First, bans of any kind do not work, period. You're simply taking personal rights away from adults who choose to consume legal and federally regulated products. Let's face it, these products will still be available. Consumers will simply drive a short distance away to neighboring counties to purchase these products or they'll order them online. It's going to be a lot harder to regulate the illicit market that will be created versus using the tools and laws that are currently available to enforce age restriction on retail. Second, Ordinance 878 is bad for small business. These retail stores, many of which are operated by minorities, will lose more revenue than the $1,500 per month mentioned by the local health authority. Those numbers only included menthol products and did not include other flavored tobacco items adults enjoy. Furthermore, it certainly didn't include the other add-on items tobacco consumers make in addition to purchasing tobacco while at a store. Third, this ordinance will not only ban the sale of flavored tobacco products, but will also ban the sale of inhaling delivery systems, including pipes for cannabis. I honestly do not think this is the intent of the commissioners. Furthermore, it takes products that the FDA has deemed being a safer alternative to cigarettes off the market. Smokers should have access to safer alternatives, and removing these products from the market is not best practice. I believe adults have the choice to use flavored tobacco products just like they have the choice to use flavored alcohol. We need to focus on enforcement and preventing the underage use of tobacco products while not taking away rights from adults and destroying small businesses and the families that operate them. And we certainly shouldn't take safer alternatives to cigarettes off the market. I urge you to pose this ban. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Jonathan Pulaski. Jonathan? Good morning, Chair Harrington, Commissioners. My name is Jonathan Polonsky. I'm President and CEO of Plaid Pantry. On behalf of Plaid Pantry and numerous other retailers operating within Washington County, I strongly encourage commissioners to vote in favor of the potential amendments proposed by Commissioner Willie. These amendments were crafted with the input of many retailers in a good faith effort to reach a middle ground between the public choice and public health. I firmly believe the proposed amendments represent a very logical approach to issues associated with underage tobacco and vaping use. They represent a comprehensive compromise. Current research is clear. The predominant issue we should attempt to address is the use of e-cigarettes and vaping products by minors. In recent years, the use of traditional tobacco products continues to decline among youth. The use of e-cigarettes and vaping products is the issue. Findings point to the fact that most minors are attracted to flavored vaping products. The FDA is addressing this issue, recently banning over 1 million products deemed not beneficial to public health. The proposed amendments call for enhanced retailer responsibilities. This coupled with the new state licensing program will lead to improved enforcement and education. The amendment also leaves in place the prohibition on coupons and select promotions. This revised ordinance in conjunction with the state's new tobacco licensing program and the FDA's action will position Washington County as a leader in the fight against underage tobacco use. It will accomplish this in a manner that continues to give adults the right to choose and businesses the ability to continue to operate without a competitive disadvantage to neighboring counties. Please vote to move this compromised version forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Daniel Lane. Daniel, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, my name is Daniel Lane, and I'm still in opposition of the ban on flavored tobacco and nicotine products. Um, since our last uh, Zoom meeting, uh, testimonies and everything, I've had the chance to chat with many small business owners in Washington County as I call on many of the small independently owned stores. Um, most of the retailers have chosen not to give a testimony on their opposition to the proposed flavor ban. The main reason that I was told by these retailers is that they just don't have the time and feel that their voices go unheard. One specific business owner 
has already began looking for someone to buy his current one of his current businesses. This person's main concern is that if he doesn't sell his business, he will be closing his store in the next year if this passes. During a pandemic, he has already seen a decline in, decline in his business's overall revenue. He has had to work more hours this past year to keep his business open due to the fact that he has lost employees to Oregon's generous unemployment programs. Many small business owners have stated they will also be forced to let employees go in order to cut costs due to the expected lost sales from the proposed ban. This is just one example of the many frustrations that small independent business owners will be facing if 878 were to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Next, we have Harjit Singh. Harjit, can you hear us? Can you uh, unmute? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Paji Singh. I own the Aqualatan Pool Store. So I'm a, I'm opposed to the, this uh, 878 because uh, on the from the last year when the Corona start, uh, we are lose a lot of business about that stuff. And you know, uh, since uh, this one that we heard, we are scared to close our store because. Uh, our customer, they're going to get it anywhere. They're going to, if they're going to smoke it, they're going to get to the other county or anywhere else. So we're going to lose the, all those customers who is buying the stuff. They come, they don't buy the, just the cigarette. They buy the milk, beers, coffee, and candies, all that business going to go away. So then we have to close the store. We have to let that employees goes and uh, I don't know what we have to do. You know, we run the by the family and uh, we don't know what we have to do because we, when we close the one store, so we lose a lot of money. And we will, if that's going to go happen is the band of Flavor Tomaku, they, we're going to lose a lot of customer and uh, lose our lot of sales. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you. Next is James Basara. James, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is uh, Dr. James Bashara. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Dornbecker Children's Hospital. I'm providing testimony today on behalf of the Oregon Pediatric Society. The Oregon Pediatric Society is the state chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which represents hundreds of pedi pediatric providers throughout Oregon. The Oregon Pediatric Society will support Ordinance 878 with amendments to remove the exemption for 21 and over establishments. We consider, when we consider the public health problem of diseases caused by tobacco, the causes of addiction must be a central focus. That starts in, before age 18 and 90%, before age 21 and 95%. Because of this, preventing addiction must focus on children. What we know about flavored products in kids Flavors increase the likelihood that children will try a tobacco product of any type. E-cigarettes are the preferred method of tobacco use. Flavors are the main reason they first try a tobacco product and the reason they use it again. Flavored products increase the frequency and duration of each use. Flavors are the reason children are becoming addicted to tobacco products. We know a flavor ban will significantly reduce youth use of tobacco products. We know that many children obtain their tobacco products from social sources. By granting a 21 and over exemption, children will still have access to flavored products. This will prevent the ordinance from achieving the intended goal of reducing addiction and reducing tobacco related diseases. An amendment is needed to remove this loophole. Finally, flavors are not tested for safety. We know for certain that some flavoring agents can cause fatal disease. Most flavoring agents have an unknown safety profile for chronic inhalational use. We know that vaping aerosols contain many toxic or cancer-causing chemicals that will cause disease. Please support a flavor ban with an amendment to remove the 21 NOVA exemption. Thank you. Okay. Next is Pat Salas. Pat, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes. we can. Good morning. Thank you, commissioners and audience. My name is Pat Solis. I am a 15-year volunteer for the American Cancer Society. 
I've lived in Washington County for more than 40 years where I pay taxes, have raised my children, and I see children coming home every day from school, from Brown Junior High, Indian Hills, Century High School, and other places. I am in favor of 878. Um, according to the Oregon Health Authority's 2020 Oregon Tobacco Facts, over 8,000 Oregonians this year will die due to tobacco-related illnesses, including 570 Washington County residents. As a taxpayer, I'm very concerned about the cost, the financial impact of tobacco in our county, which is estimated to be more than $400 million per year in medical costs and lost productivity. According to the CDC Foundation, from February of 2020 through June of 2021, during the COVID pandemic, e-cigarette purchases in Oregon increased 19%. 72.3% of those were flavored uh, type products. I'm concerned that we are the adults and we have a responsibility to our youth to make strong decisions and good decisions that will serve them well. I am the child of two smokers, um, both developed illnesses, cancer related to this. I don't want to see that happen to our young children. Um, you know, I think about Halloween and all the candy. Why do we get candy? It's because it's flavored. Think about the same thing for our kids. Please put in a ban on flavored products. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Lily Manful. Lily, can you hear us? Hi, yes. Can you hang on for one second? Of course. Uh, just for a matter of courtesy, I know we have uh, members of our public uh, still yet to speak during the public hearing, and we are going to continue with your testimony. We also have uh, members of our community and some of our advisory boards and commissions who are currently attending this meeting uh, regarding three action items that are later on our agenda. Given the time, uh, I know we'll, I hope that we'll finish the public hearing on this and then take a lunch break for an hour. So I feel very comfortable as the, as in pre presiding over this meeting to let folks know that we will not be taking up the action items until after one o'clock. So for those of you staff, as well as uh, community members, who are here for the three action items, do feel free to rejoin the Zoom after the one o'clock hour. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk Moss and Ms. Manville for letting me interrupt. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you Chair Harrington and the Washington County Board of Commissioners for giving me the opportunity to speak today in support of proposed ordinance 878 with the amendment to remove the 21 and over exemption. My name is Lily Jones Manbell. I am the staff organizer at the Tobacco Free Coalition of Oregon. I'm here today on behalf of my organization, which advocates for tobacco use prevention across the state, but I'm also here as a former smoker and a mother of two elementary school kids. I had my first cigarette when I was 12. I snuck it from a family member who was visiting my parents, and it was it was pretty gross, but I didn't stop smoking uh, from then until I purchased my own. My friends were able to do the same as I did, and we shared them with each other. Uh, I bought my first pack of cigarettes two weeks before I reached the legal age of purchase in 1993. I am lucky that I was able to quit smoking many years ago. Not all of my friends have been so lucky. Uh, the Tobacco Free Coalition of Oregon supports the amendment proposed by Chair Harrington and Commissioner Fye to end tobacco flavor sales altogether in Washington County, because as we all know, those flavors are designed to ensnare our children into a lifetime of tobacco use and addiction. Enhanced age verification, as proposed by Commissioner Willie, would have stopped me from buying that first pack of cigarettes, but it wouldn't have stopped me from all the cigarettes I smoked before that when I flew under the regulatory radar at my house and my friends' houses, becoming addicted to nicotine. It's just, it's just not enough protection for our kids. Um, I'm not surprised kids don't want to procure cigarettes and e-cigarettes. I am surprised 
it's as easy for them today as it was for me more than 30 years ago. My second grader is five years from the age I smoked my first cigarette. You guys have the chance to lead on this today. Please do. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Shagan. Can you hear us? Manang Karma, Karmi. Could you unmute? Yeah. Oh, there you go. There. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. My name is Sugam Manam Karmi. I'm a retailer. I'm a retailer here. Thank you for being, giving me a chance and to speak, and thank you for your time. Actually, I haven't spoken in public, but I have to speak it today to save my business. Since we are selling all other products, I think I sh we should be able to sell the menthol and vape too. If they, they go to other store, they, they can still get from other store. So, so we'll be losing our customer. The customer who come to our store, they're not 21. They're more of, most of them are middle age, 40 plus. But we, we still... We still I did the cost all the customer um, less than less if it's less than 30. We ID all the customer. Um, uh, we have the electronic uh, the ID checker on our store. So since other store can sell it, they'll go to other store and we will lose our customer. They just don't come to buy the cigarette. They come to fill up gas, they they buy chips and other stuff too. So if they stop coming to our store, we we'll lose lots of customer. So I think we should be able to sell the smoke in the vapor and the menthol in our store too. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Sean Cleave. Sean, can you hear us? Chair Harrington, uh, members of the Washington County Commission, for the record, I'm Sean Cleave, representing the Taxpayers Association of Oregon. Uh, I'd just like to remind uh, the commission regarding my earlier testimony that these provisions will primarily impact low-income Oregonians. Uh, not only that, but the tax revenues that are collected through nicotine sales are provided uh, for services across the state. The, in 2018, the Legislative Revenue Office estimated 120 million in reduction in the statewide number for uh, tobacco tax. Uh, of course, that would be a statewide number. Uh, however, Washington County is the second largest uh, populous county in Oregon. Uh, specific to some of the amendments, uh, I would agree with Mr. Willie that uh, there are some confusing and uh, overly broad jurisdictional uh, complications that are provided in some of the amendments. And then secondly, in Mr. Willie's uh, amendment um, under prohibitions 2.030B, uh, the new language would say flavor inhaling delivery system restricted, no per persons shall offer for sale or otherwise, and so on. I think that uh, this may capture a variety of other products that uh, are currently being used on the market, such as uh, vapor delivery uh, vitamin systems. Uh, I'm a runner and uh, Believe it or not, those types of uh, vitamin B12 vapor inhalant systems are used for post-race uh, recovery. Um, I just think that uh, the, the amendments as, as proposed uh, go a step too far. Uh, I'd prefer the county to um, uh, experiment after January 1 when the new uh, state provisions go into effect. I think those will predominantly address any issues that have come up today regarding underage access to these products. Thank you, Mr. Cleave. Next is Emily Souls. Emily, can you hear us? Chair Harrington, members of the commission, for the record, Emily Souls representing the Oregon Small Business Association and the Oregon Vapor Trade Association in opposition to Washington County Ordinance 878 and amendments. The Oregon Small Business Association previously submitted written testimony on how this would harm small businesses. For the sake of time, I won't repeat those points. The issue today is how can we prevent youth access? In the past year alone, Oregon passed a large tax on nicotine products, raising the price and providing additional funding for tobacco cessation services. 
The 2021 Oregon legislature just passed a remote sales ban to prevent youth from ordering these products online and a statewide licensing program. Oregon Vapor Trade Association supported both of these bills and worked with legislators under a shared goal of keeping these products away from youth. These small businesses are not big tobacco and they do not have marketing budgets. There are already conversations underway at the state level to take further steps in preventing youth access. Ordinance 878 would simply send youth to other counties, to the black market, or inspire scary, unregulated do-it-yourself alternatives. For those reasons and more, the Oregon Small Business Association and the Oregon Vapor Trade Association oppose Ordinance 878 and its proposed amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Eric Fruits. Hi, good morning, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Chair Harrington and commissioners, I am Eric Fruits, Research Director at Cascade Policy Institute. I testified at the first public hearing on this ordinance and I reaffirm that testimony. Now, I'd like to think that I'm fairly smart and on top of things, but I'm embarrassed to admit at this point, I have no idea what the Washington County Commission is trying to do with this ordinance. At first, we were told that the county wants to reduce underage tobacco use. Now, it seems clear from the amendments that the county is seeking to drive out of business dozens of vape shops and convenience stores. Cloaking this new initiative as a flavor ban is simply disingenuous. You know as well as anyone that these stores cannot survive if they're stuck selling only one or two flavors. And you know as well as I do that this ordinance and its amendments will do almost nothing to reduce nicotine use in Washington County. At this point, it seems that the ordinance is no longer about good policy. It's about scoring a win and settling scores. So I urge you to please step back and ask yourselves, what are we trying to accomplish? And is this ban the best way to do it? At this point, I don't think you know what you're trying to accomplish. And if you do, you're not telling us. I also think that you know that these bans are a blunt tool that look great in press releases, but will do nothing to improve public health. So I urge you to please step back, oppose Ordinance 878 and the proposed amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Tom Engel. Tom, can you hear us? I think I can now. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can. But thanks. I'm the uh, been a nurse for almost 50 years, former director at Benton County and former director at uh, Clatsop County. Uh, because I wanted to understand a little more about the stores, I did look up and saw that the National Association of Convenience Stores uh, found in the year 2020 that transactions decreased 13.9% in those stores, but the inside sales actually increased 1.5%. Now, of course, I don't know what that means in terms of an individual store in the county, but I'm I'm not surprised uh, that convenience stores have done okay and it's a burgeoning business and uh, there's gonna be a lot of competition as they continue to do well. I also wanna thank you for as your role as a board of health for taking on this issue. It's a important thing. The tobacco industry, which is growers, the processors, the wholesalers, the retailers, and to be fair, uh, those of us who have investments in, in retirement incomes that, that uh, invest in tobacco companies. That is the tobacco industry in total. They always want to tell us that this is about adults. It never is. The business model has always been harvest youth so they will be a lifetime addicted person. Don't worry about the fact that they have a 10 to 15 year less life expectancy and try to please completely ignore the information that says that this costs all of us a lot of money in providing health care and lost work productivity because of those who use tobacco. So again, the industry wants us to think this is about adults, but it's not. It's about harvesting youth for their long-term lifelong addiction. Uh, thanks and uh, good luck. I wish, wish you well with the issue. Thank you. Next is Gerard Aguilar. Gerard, can you hear us? Can you unmute, Mr. Aguilar? There you go. There you go. Good morning, Commissioner Harrington and commissioners. Um, my name is Gerard Aguilar. I'm from Jackson's Food Store. Uh, we currently operate 11 stores in the Washington County area, and we employ nearly 80 employees in our store locations. Um, this ban would make Washington County an island where adult consumers would simply drive outside county limits to get their tobacco products, as well as their other purchases of gas, drinks, snack items, and more. 
The loss of sales from tobacco and all other items from this ban would cause us to have to reduce employee hours or worse, potentially lay off employees, just one of the many unintended consequences of this proposed ordinance. Retailers like us are the front line to prohibiting youth access to tobacco products. And per the FDA compliance check inspections, Washington County retailers have a 99% compliance rate since 2018 of selling tobacco products to adults only. And at Jackson's, we take the following proactive steps to ensure our employees are responsible retailers. We have training on all of our employees to, for uh, proper checking of ID. We do age verification on our systems. And we also do internal shops to ensure current correct adherence to laws and policies. Addressing the youth vaping epidemic should not lead our local government to overextend and excessively restrict the sale of all other flavored tobacco products. That's why I ask you to oppose the current ordinance being discussed and instead support the amendment proposed by Commissioner Willie. And I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Larissa Whalen. Larissa, can you hear us? Yes, good morning. My name is Larissa Whalen Garfias, and I'm a physician assistant with the Virginia Garcia School Based Health Center in Forest Grove. I am here today to testify in support of Ordinance 878. In my work at the School Based Health Center, I talk with teens a lot about tobacco use and vaping. After years of hard work to educate our kids and teens about the dangers of tobacco use, the rate of cigarette smoking uh, significantly declined and, uh, from 2011 to 2020. Truth be told, smoking isn't cool anymore. Youth know and understand that smoking tobacco can cause cancer and other health problems. And according to the CDC, more than 95% of youth have said no thanks to cigarettes. But just as we were making gains in preventing tobacco use in youth, vaping and flavored tobacco hit the market. Cigarette smoke may smell gross, but cotton candy e-juice not only smells good, it tastes good. Most of my patients who share with me that they're vaping tell me that they think it's safe. And why wouldn't they think it's safe with flavors like gummy bears, banana split, Skittles, and Hawaiian punch? Because vape products are so easy to get, undetectable by design, come in a wide array of kid-friendly flavors and are increasingly popular on social media, vaping has become cool. According to the Oregon Health Authority, more than 10% of eighth graders and nearly 25% of 11th graders vaped in 2019. Vaping is not harmless. One pod or vape cartridge contains the same amount of, nic of nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. And nicotine is highly addictive. What's more is that it causes disproportionate harm to the developing adolescent brain, affecting the prefrontal cortex, which controls attention, learning, mood, and impulse control. Vaping also exposes users to metals and solvents known to cause cancer. We know that teens who use tobacco are more likely to become adults who use tobacco. With these increased rates of tobacco use in youth, my kids' generation is facing a public health crisis if we fail to take immediate action. As a mom and a pediatric healthcare provider, I urge your support on ordinance number 878. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we have Tom Eshelman. Tom, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yep. I can. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Eshelman. I uh, worked for uh, Doyle Sheehan for 42 years, and we have a, a facility in down in Clackamas, and I really oppose this 878 for the following reasons. The federal government's already banned uh, tobacco and vaping for those under 21. The FDA is currently reviewing all the vape items out there. I think we need to let them follow that process, let that work through on the federal level before we attack this at the state level. And also, more importantly, is I think that we are just singling out all those business owners and stores within Washington County, uh, it's going to really, really hurt. I think you're going to see a tremendous amount of those places closed. You're going to see decreased tax revenue. Uh, and it's just hurting those people within your county. Uh, when Washington raised the tobacco tax at the beginning of the year, we seen a, a drastic reduction in sales. The people who were from Washington were coming over, stopped. They went back to Washington. And given the geographics of Washington County, those people will just come outside and buy the products, take it back. Also, somebody's not going to stop at the store, buy a few items, then drive down the road to get the other stuff. They're going to just keep driving by those stores, and they'll they'll buy their stuff, and they will go back uh, there. So Washington County is going to be the big loser on this whole thing. Uh, you know, I am kind of concerned. I mean, nobody wants the uh, youth to be smoking, but I guess I'm kind of concerned with Oregon. You know, they legalize meth. 
LSD, oxycodone, these hard drugs, but yet you can't smoke a menthol cigarette. I kind of uh, question about that. Also, uh, Commissioner Wiley, I think his is the best of the three, but I think we should just table this, see what the federal government does out of concern for just your people in Washington County. Uh, our retailers, they all strive to not sell to youth. So I think that, uh, you know, we're all working hard towards that. Thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate you listening and vote no. Thank you. Next, Madam Chair, we have Marty Cardi. Marty, can you hear us? Good morning, Chair Harrington and members of the board. I'm Marty Cardi, Government Affairs Director at the Oregon Primary Care Association, which is a nonprofit organization with a mission to support Oregon's 34 community health centers, also known as federally qualified health centers. Community health centers deliver integrated primary, oral, and behavioral health care services to over 433,000 Oregonians annually. In Washington County, Virginia Garcia and Neighborhood Health Center are the community health centers providing care to Oregon's underserved populations, including one in six Oregon Health Plan members. We are here today in support of Ordinance 878 and the amendments banning the sale of flavored tobacco products. Smoking is the number one cause of preventable death in Oregon and providers and care teams see firsthand how smoking related illnesses impact patients and their families. Oregon's community health centers serve patients with tobacco, <clears throat> who tobacco companies have targeted for decades. Communities of color, tribes, low income and LGBTQ communities. And now their advertising campaigns are marketing directly to Oregon's youth through nicotine filled flavor products. Since 2017, the number of middle, -aged, middle school aged kids who say they have tried an e-cigarette has increased by 48%, effectively creating a whole new generation of addicted smokers and leading to downstream health complications. The Oregon Primary Care Association believes a measure which bans all flavors across combustibles and vaping products alike is the best policy and we support Washington County's efforts to chip away at the unprecedented growth in nicotine dependence, especially among Oregon's youth. OPCA also believes that measure 878 should be strengthened through Chair Harrington and Commissioner Fye's amendments to remove the 21 and over store exemption and ban the sale of flavored tobacco products. There is no evidence that adult only access or that adult only retailers prevent sales to kids and young people. In fact, you've heard how youth access those harmful products through friends, family, and other social sources. Thank you for your time and your support. Thank you. Next, we have Wei Rafael. Wei, can you hear us? Can you unmute? Okay, we will go back to the one that couldn't. Um, Ku Zeng, can, can you unmute now? There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, hello, Chair Harrington and Washington County Board of Commissioners. Um, my name is Kua Zhang. I am the Interim Advocacy and Civic Engagement Director at APANO. Our organization unites Asians and Pacific Islanders to build power, develop leaders, and advance equity through organizing advocacy, community development, and cultural work. I'm, I am expressing um, APANO support um, for Commissioner Nafisa Fai's amendment to Ordinance um, 878 to ban the sale of all flavored tobacco in Washington County. Um, we know that vaping companies like Big Tobacco owned Juul are hooking um, a new generation of kids on nicotine with candy flavored e-cigarettes and it's working. Um, vaping among Oregon youth increased 80% in the last years. Um, youth are vaping, uh, youth that vape are three times more likely to smoke cigarettes. Um, we've also seen an increase in those over 21 years begin to use flavored tobacco in the last several years due to the increase in popularity of products like Big Tobacco owned Juul. Um, Apano also supports um, our small businesses um, during this pandemic, especially, and will continue this work um, in future years. We also acknowledge that the, the vicious system that Big Tobacco has intentionally implanted in its products in Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities to disproportionately addict and hook these communities. This also looks like Big Tobacco planting products in small businesses owned by these communities. Um, this is how the, the, the uh, tobacco industry is able to be as powerful as it is, right? Um, and it's not the fault of small business owners. We don't have that view or that stance. It's a vicious, but it's a it's a vicious a system that we must interrupt in order to save or Oregonian lives. 
Um, Washington County has a critical role to play in addressing the smoking pandemic, which is the number one cause of preventable death in Oregon, regardless of age. Um, this proposed uh, amendment recognizes that in order to achieve this goal of uh, restricting youth tobacco and tobacco in general, we need to follow the best practices in the field of prevention and adopt a full ban. Um, a panel supports this thank, amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, that is the entire list of people that signed up. So now if there's anyone who wishes for a comment that has not already commented, we have one hand, two hands, okay. Thomas, please go ahead. Chair Harrington and board members, my name is Tom Bryant and I'm the executive director of the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, a trade association with member stores in Washington County. NATO submitted a letter to the board in August, which raised the following concerns about the ordinance. First, three studies have found that banning all flavored tobacco products led to an increase in smoking among youth and young adults, causing a new public health problem. Second, with historically low and declining tobacco use rates by Washington high school students, the empirical data does not support a wholesale ban on all flavored products. Third, the Food and Drug Administration announced that it will be issuing a new rule banning the sale of menthol cigarettes and all flavored cigars nationwide. Fourth, the FDA has now rejected or denied marketing applications from hundreds of companies for more than 6 million flavored electronic cigarette and nicotine vapor products. All of these products are now coming off the market. In fact, to date, the FDA has only approved one tobacco flavored electronic cigarette for sale. The board should consider allowing the FDA to continue its regulatory process. NATO's second letter submitted just yesterday lists 13 specific instances where the recent presentation made by the Health and Human Services staff referenced inaccurate information, cited out-of-date studies, demonstrated a disregard for current actions by regulatory agencies, and relied on data that only supported a flavor ban. In short, the presentation was not evidence-based, but relied on selected information to support a flavor ban. Retailers that we represent are not the problem but local stores will be financially impacted by a full flavor ban and employee jobs will be placed at risk. As lawmakers, we ask that you care about your local businesses and their employees just as much as the health of county residents. For all of these reasons, NATO and its retail members urge you to not support a flavor ban ordinance. Thank you. Uh, Heather Wadia, can you unmute? Yes, thank you. My name is Heather McMahon Wadia. I am a resident of Washington County and a mother of a seventh grader and a fifth grader in the Beaverton School District. I am testifying in support of Ordinance 878 and a comprehensive flavor ban on all tobacco products in Washington County. Flavored tobacco products are being used by the tobacco industry to lure and addict kids, their next generation of tobacco users, their future client base. We know this. And listening to everyone's public comment, it also sounds like people on both sides of this issue also know this, that these <laughs> flavors are attractive and being marketed to kids. Gummy bear flavored vape juice is not made nor sold to meet strong consumer demand by 30 plus year old vape users. Candy flavored tobacco products are not made to help people stop smoking. These flavors are a known tactic to lure youth. And they've worked. Today, one in four Oregon high schoolers report using vape products. That's a 77% increase in tobacco use via these flavors. As a parent, this is terrifying. I'm in the generation that watched his grandparents succumb to lung cancer. I feel like we've already fought this fight and here we go again. Same fight against big tobacco, different flavor. I urge the Washington County commissioners to please do the right thing on behalf of Washington County youth. Passing a tobacco flavor ban will, it will stop many kids from trying a deadly and addictive product, which remember is why the host of flavored tobacco products were created in the first place. As a parent and a voter, I'm urging you to pass ordinance 878 and ban flavored tobacco products in Washington County. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we'll try one more time, Mr. Rafael. Way, Rafael, can you unmute? Able to? Does not appear so, Madam Chair. Can so, you uh, check one last time to see if there's anyone else? Uh, are there any other members of the public that wish to provide public testimony to the board on this ordinance? 
We're not seeing anyone else, Madam Chair. All righty. And with that, I'd like to close today's public hearing. Given the time and the fact that we will uh, likely have some commissioner discussion about this matter, as well as three subsequent action items. At this time, I would like to call a lunch break and have us reconvene in one hour at 1.05. All right, is that clear for everyone? Okay, thank you. We'll see you back here on the same, well, Clerk Moss, is there an afternoon Zoom link? Um, no, Madam Chair, so we can keep this, I will keep this link open with IT so everyone can stay on and then measures you can rejoin if you wish for lunch. Okay, terrific. Thank you, everyone. So then I see Commissioner Rogers in the attendees list. Yes, let's wait on him to accept our invite. Okay, and, and I see Catherine as well. Okay. All right, welcome Great. back Great. commissioners and Madam Chair, it is back to you. Terrific, we have all members of the County Commission. Welcome back everyone from our lunch break. Uh, just before the break, we had concluded the public hearing on um, our third read and second public hearing of Washington County Ordinance 878. Uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us today in testimony. And if I hadn't uh, moved my paper on myself, I would be able to acknowledge that we had over 43 people who came and testified today. And this is in addition to the over 150 pieces of correspondence that we have received and made available to commissioners just from last Wednesday onward. So big thank you to all of our staff for helping collect all of that and package it up for Board of Commissioners convenience. So uh, I do know that we have uh, the main ordinance 878, uh, as well as uh, some amendment proposals. So um, Commissioner Fai, uh, you've unmuted. Do you wanna go ahead? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Harrington. I would like to make a motion to amend the ordinance. Uh, during uh, the second hearing of this ordinance, I suggested some strong public health uh, best practices changes to the ordinance. I withdrew my motion to give us as a board more time to review the changes that I was suggesting. 
Uh, since then, a lot of discussion took place and I have considered both amendments. In addition to uh, my amendment with that, I would like to make a motion to amend the ordinance starting the changes on pages 175 to 178, label Chair Harrington amendment. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Go ahead, Commissioner Treese. It looks like you're trying to track something first. I, I don't understand. Could I ask? Uh, uh, could I ask Commissioner Fye to repeat that, please? Yep. Oops. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Uh, yes. So I was um, um, making a recommendation or making a motion to amend the ordinance starting the changes that are on pages 175 to 178 and it will be the amendments labeled chair Harrington amendments which is the one that our county uh, council and, and the chair and everyone reviewed and much more cleaner version go ahead commissioner trees so I, I, does this mean that Commissioner Fai is withdrawing her amendment and- uh, She never made her amendment today. That's right, that's right. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'm just a little confused. I'm on track now, I think. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, it's the same. It's, yeah. Okay, Similar. thank you. Got it. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second up. Commissioner Tree seconds the motion. Uh, now the floor is open for discussion. Commissioner Fire, Commissioner Tree, do you want to speak first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can. I can take. I really, you know, we've heard from everyone, and and. Before I get into that, there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of work internal that has been done. And I also do want to recognize our county staff and our leadership team for really tackling this issue and tracking it, making sure all everyone uh, gets to speak their time and, and get their written testimony submitted, whether they have to make some corrections and resubmit. So I really appreciate that. Uh, that has been really a, 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 an interesting journey and uh, quite a few um, meetings that we've had. I think ultimately what we're here to do as the Board of Health and as the Board of Commissioners is to ultimately protect uh, our community. And, and, and I ultimately want to do that. This is why I run for office. And, uh, and I won't repeat, you've heard from both sides. Um, everyone is looking for a fair uh, uh, amendment, and I think um, this amendment presents that, um, and I would like to also um, let the retailers know that, you know, I met what I said last time in our work sessions to try to figure out our economic development, what other opportunities and collaborations we can do on our end to help our retailers uh, to repivot their business plans. Um, I really want to um, ensure everyone that this is in the benefits and in the greater good for uh, people in Washington County. And I would hope that our chair and our board members will join me in supporting this amendment. This will really help um, uh, reposition Washington County as a bold commissioners, as a bold board that really um, changes the trajectory of Oregon and, 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 and you know, empower others to follow our suit. Um, this is a hard decision, and, but we're ultimately protecting our community and our youth. And this is why people elected us. So. Thank you, Commissioner Fye. Commissioner Trees. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. I. Um, I have written some things down and I'd like, I'd like frankly to read my thoughts. So uh, the process to decide my vote on ordinance 878 and any follow-up amendments has been a long one. 
I've read every letter. I've talked with every person and group who has asked to meet with me. I have solicited opinions from elected leaders, from individuals in the education community, the medical and the dental community. I have visited several convenience stores, both franchised and individually owned. There's compelling arguments for everybody that's presented here. I started my teaching career as a health educator with a strong focus on anti-smoking for youth. My first job in the private sector was in the realm of wellness, where I instituted some of the first smoking bans in the workplace in the early 1980s. I'm familiar with the resistance to smoking related controls and concerns. I've also spent many years in economic development and the support of businesses in this region. I'm familiar with the narrow margins on which our small businesses operate. I've also seen the flexibility and ingenuity of our, our businesses, both small, medium, and large. I'm a grandmother with four grandchildren under the age of 12, and frankly, the number of children using tobacco products in our county was shocking to me. 9% of eighth graders and 18% of 11th graders reported using tobacco products and not just vaping products. I've also learned that this is a social justice issue. We cannot turn a blind eye to how our uh, BIPOC, particularly black and brown youth are disproportionately impacted. Throughout my education on this issue, there's been a compelling point. It has been stated by all of our commissioners that they would support a statewide ban that would reflect the components of Ordinance 878 with the amendment. I've learned that throughout the country, states that have instituted a ban of this type typically started with individual counties showing the leadership to set the path forward. I believe that my role as commissioner and a member of the County Public Health Authority is to listen to our public health department and closely consider their professional advice, including public health best practices. I will be voting to support Ordinance 878 and the amendment that's on the table right now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Treese. Uh, as is our normal protocol, the chair usually speaks last. So I'll ask Commissioner Willie or Commissioner Rogers if you have anything you'd wish to say with regard to the motion for this amendment. Sure. You, do you want to go last, Jerry, or do you want me to go? Yeah, go ahead, Roy. I'll, I'll follow up. All right. Thank you. Well, it doesn't take a genius to figure there's three votes. So uh, we. Jerry had a, uh, Commissioner Willie had a, a, an amendment that I would have supported. I think it goes without saying that uh, every one of us is anti-tobacco, probably me more than any of you. I'm really anti-tobacco. But uh, having said that, uh, I don't see that this ordinance is going to prohibit any youth usage. Uh, I heard from individuals in my district and you heard from those groups today and you heard from retailers. Uh, it's easy to get to products. It's easy to go across the county line and, and procure products. So I don't see this doing anything other than hurting our local retailers. Uh, does that mean that I like tobacco use? Absolutely not. Do I wish we had a statewide ban? Absolutely. I, I think that would make the playing field fair. But in this particular case, I don't think that we're going to uh, achieve what we hope to achieve by behavioral change. Uh, but reasonable people have different ideas and we come to different conclusions. So I, I, I'm not unhappy, I'm just saddened that we couldn't have had uh, state representatives who said, we'll take that fight up and we'll do it on a statewide basis. I'm saddened that we've got small retailers who are going to lose uh, positions. I, I'm saddened that uh, over two or 300 years ago, they found something called tobacco and they started marketing because it's, it's, uh, it's a terrible product. But we are where we're at, and my preference would have been uh, to uh, wait and let the legislature deal with this in January, see what else we could do. But I understand that others are trying to craft the policies today. So that's where I'm at. Commissioner Willie. Yeah, I think... Um... I think if you want to be if you want to be sad about something, uh, I'm sad about the fact that 
Commissioner Therese has already came to this meeting with a yes, which means that there's no purpose to discussion, um, which I believe is the integral part of working together as a board, is hearing what each one of us think and say, certainly hearing to the 40 plus people that testified today and being willing to consider something that is not as extreme as what we're considering right now. And if you wanna go back to my philosophy, you've all heard it, it's the tyranny of the or, it's not one or the other. We should be able to find something that works for everybody. And in this particular case, I believe we've lost focus on what it is that we set out to accomplish. We set out in the original purpose to enhance the availability, the, res the restrictiveness of availability to under 21 to access these products. That's where we started. And the debate was going to be pretty vigorous, even at that, where we were talking about how do these kids get the product in the first place? Um, who provides this? How can we restrict it? How can we, we never even got into the conversation hardly about marketing. We talk about big tobacco and how they market. Well, then let's address the marketing issues that we have but we didn't even get there. We immediately went to ban from Commissioner Fye's amendment. And now we're dealing with what is the impact of a ban, a total ban? And we're gonna see the impact. And, and, and Pam, you can say we have to protect, and Commissioner Fye's the same thing. We gotta, we gotta protect our minority groups and from being unreasonably marketed to and all those kinds of things. How many of those convenience stores that we heard this morning, how many of them do you think was minority owned? Probably 95% of them. We're hearing from the minority community. And the minority community is saying to us, you're killing us. We heard last week that it's only $18,000 impact on the profits. And the American Cancer Society in their brief here said there are just 233 retailers. I can't believe that we're deminimizing the very group that we say, I hear this commission say we're here to protect. And yet we're throwing them all under the bus including those who are of legal age to make this decision. And yet you're saying, no, nope. you know, we're just smarter than you. We're, we're gonna make this decision for you because we know you can't do it on your own. Under the presumption from the American Cancer Society and everybody else, that the people over 21 are going to stop smoking or stop vaping because we've restricted it. No, they're not. We all travel all over the Tri-County region on a regular basis. We're just moving all those access to those products to our neighboring counties. And if Multnomah County follows our suit, hallelujah, Columbia County, Yamhill County, Clackamas County, they're not gonna follow this. I've already heard from them. So again, Going back to what, what is it that we were trying to accomplish? Making it more restrictive for people under 21 years of age to have these products. And it's flavored tobacco. I love the fact that we talk about flavored tobacco, but we don't talk about flavored marijuana. Look at all of the flavored products designed to attract and if you think our under 21 crowd doesn't, don't smoke marijuana, you know, well, I'm pretty sure you understand they absolutely do. They have all the same flavors that flavored tobacco does. So what do you, which would you prefer if they're going to smoke? Which would you prefer they smoke? Vaping or marijuana? 
let's be realistic. Vaping looks pretty good at that point. So let's deal with the issue. The issue being that we're trying to restrict under 21. The second issue is how do we restrict marketing to those folks and marketing to our BIPOC communities and everybody else. And I'm sorry, but banning menthol cigarettes because our African-Americans are the ones predominantly that use those products? What's that purpose? I mean, these people are over 21, they're adults. They can make their own decisions. And we're saying no, and those cigarettes are being targeted at African-American communities. And so therefore we should take that away from them. I totally disagree with that as well. And we talk about the medical impact. Don't disagree. My mother-in-law died of cancer, smoked all of her life. We've all grown up with it. The financial statistics that have been given to us are based on our grandparents and us older generation adults who have been smoking all of our life. That's not, I say our unilaterally, that's not me, but they're the ones creating this. We don't, we're trying to stop the next generation from creating more of that. I get that, but it, this is not the right way to do this. And, and lastly, the, the thing that intrigued me most was we heard this morning of the person who did what any teenager would do, went online, ordered the product, got the product within a few days, and no age was asked. And we really think this ban amendment is going to help. It's going to just make those even better. It's going to make these online organizations have the profits. The tobacco tax will go out of state. And our youth will still have access to this because we're not, a de we're not dealing with the root problem. And to me, the root problem is access to these things and marketing to these. So I won't go on. This is a bad idea. A ban is not going to accomplish what I think Commissioner Fye started out. I don't think it's going to accomplish what her focus was, and it's certainly not going to focus what we as a county would like it to. We can do different things and we can do it better. First of all, um, I'd like to uh, respond to Commissioner Willie's comment about me coming to this meeting uh, with a predetermined idea. I trust that all of us, all five of us, have done research. I think we have listened. I think we have talked to people. And frankly, I know that I have listened to every single person and I have come to my own conclusions. So to call me out individually, Commissioner Willie, I think is unfair. And I am, I'm just letting you know that when I, I take this. I take this role very, very seriously, especially, especially in light of being the public health authority. So I have listened very closely to everybody and I just want to go on record reiterating that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Treese and thank you commissioners in total. And I'll make my remarks now. First, I want to thank Commissioner Fai for challenging us and asking more questions since staff brought a first proposal to us in late July. Because of your persistence and work, it has caused me to ask more questions, uh, probably more than both our public health staff, uh, Marnie, Gwen, uh, Mira, Tom, and Brad wished that I had uh, brought forward to them. 
I feel so very well supported by our public health experts as well as our legal county experts. As uh, you've, you've heard from both Commissioner Treese and Commissioner Fai, this amendment uh, increases our embrace of best practices. Um, and first, I want to step back for a moment and thank everyone who has helped us get to this point of consideration. I earlier remarked about the number of emails and letters uh, that have received. And through the two different public hearings that we've held, we have certainly heard quite a variety of perspectives. I wanna also th say thank you to the convenience store uh, owners and representatives for helping me learn more about the range of products and to understand the monetary impacts of our potential decision-making. The proposal from you uh, has been published as Commissioner Willie's amendment today. So I was able to recognize it, thank you. I also wanna thank the community members who weighed in, especially those who shared very personal stories on the impact of tobacco product use. Our, our goal, our objective through this whole process from late July through August and versions there into September, additional work, questioning, learnings, and into October with our work session last week, as well as today's public hearing. Our goal has been and remains to protect our youth. Our staff has supported us all along the way to enable us to put best practice methods into operation, and I'm grateful for it. We have been informed by the data from the 2019 Oregon Healthy Team Survey, specific information from our youth right here in Washington County about how tobacco product use, which includes traditional smoke cigarettes, chews, and vape products is impacting them. They certainly use flavored tobacco products and youth are still using all forms of tobacco, cigarettes, chew, hookah, cigarellos, not just vape. The industry makes these products very attractive to them. And in this survey, over half of youth smokers use menthol cigarettes. So I appreciate how this amendment identifies all of these products. Menthol cigarettes increase smoking initiation and progression to regular smoking among youth and young adults, according to the survey data provided to us by our staff. Additionally, we have the data that says that we've known for decades that the tobacco industry has targeted kids, black Americans and other groups with marketing for menthol cigarettes, creating a social justice issue. Having a complete ban on flavors will eliminate the advertising and marketing to these products. This assists in discouraging youth access in, in, and initiation, as well as denormalizes the use of tobacco in our communities, not just for use, for youths, sorry. <laughs> for me, Ensuring that we are keeping with proven and successful tobacco prevention public health strategies 
is what it's all about for us in our service as the County Board of Health. Thank you, Commissioner Five, for continue, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Trees, for continuing to voice our role in that. And Commissioner Five, once again, thank you for being brave uh, and making sure that we are using our leadership and our authority to help protect the youth of our community as well as our wider community. And with that, I'll make one last sweep to see if there are any commissioner comments to wrap up before we have a vote on this amendment. Go ahead, Commissioner Willie. Yeah, I just wanna be clear about one thing. Uh, I don't think Roy and I's no on this issue is an advocacy for the tobacco industry or support for our youth or anybody else smoking. I think Roy has indicated pretty strongly that he is not a fan of tobacco use and, uh, and neither am I. So our point to make sure it's clear is not a vote for the tobacco industry. It was a vote for finding balance and another way that we can make this work better. So I want to make sure that, that I'm clear on that. This is, I'm not voting for increased use by anyone of the tobacco products. So with that, I call the question. Okay, commissioners, we have a motion and a second and a call for question. Uh, Mr. Carr, with call the question, I can just take the vote on the amendment, correct? Yes. Okay, I'm just role modeling uh, to make sure that we, it's always good to check with your attorney to make sure you're following procedure properly. Thank you. All those in favor of adopting this amendment, uh, known as now known as the Commissioner Fi Amendment as seconded by Vice Chair Trees, please vote by raising your hand or saying aye. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? Thank you, commissioners. The amendment passes three to two. And now to the amended ordinance. Uh, Mr. Carr, I believe at this stage of the game, we need a motion to continue to a fourth read uh, and not sure, if, and a public hearing perhaps for November 2nd, correct? correct? Yes. Do we have such a motion for a fourth read and a third public hearing uh, scheduled for November 2nd? Commissioner Fire, Commissioner Treese. Okay, we have a motion and a second from Commissioner Fire and Commissioner Treese. All those, uh, any discussion? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye or raise your hand. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? Thank you, commissioners. The motion passes three to two. So a, an updated ordinance 878, probably an A version. Uh, it it will be an, right. engrossed, an engrossed ordinance. Engrossed ordinance, thank you. Uh, will be published for uh, fourth read, public hearing, and hopefully final vote next Tuesday, November 2nd. Thank you. Whew. And now we pick back up with our previously hey, chair. I, yes, ma'am. Just a slight correction. Next Tuesday is not November 2nd. Oh, you are correct. I Thank just want to, I just- Two for, weeks for from record. today. <laughs> Two weeks from today, November 2nd. <laughs> Thank you. I can't afford to lose any weeks in my life, can I? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so we still have that's it for public hearings, but we still have three action items on our agenda for this afternoon. And I want to thank uh, Mira Samantle and Gwen for, and Mr. Carr and his staff for uh, participating in our, our long journey 
uh, on this, uh, but particularly in this meeting. Commissioner Fai. Chair Harrington, this is about the action items and the item that I pulled from the consent agenda. I have a bit of a scheduling conflict today. Um, I like to log off at 2.15 at the latest. Okay. Um, Mr. Carr and Ms. Angie, would there be a problem if we take uh, that consented, former consent agenda item number 13 first in the order of our action items? So I see Greg Wynum is, oh, and he just uh, messaged me back. He is ready to present. Um, so Clerk Moss, if you can promote Greg Wynum, and I believe um, Courtney from County Council is on as well. Yeah, that's, I was just going to check that with Mr. Carr. I want to make sure that his staff is fully available as well. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to our action items. And the first one, Mr. Carr, do I get a thumbs up from you or a wait? I'm looking for Courtney. Just give me one moment, please. Okay. Uh, um, she is not online currently. Okay. Well, let's start first, if we could, with the first action item while Courtney is able to join us and move to the introduction and first reading of proposed ordinance number 884, an ordinance amending Washington County Animal Services Code chapter 602. And this is where I need to find my packet online. Now I'm the one that is a little bit behind the times. Uh, I believe this is one where Mr. Carr, we would need you to read the ordinance by title only. I know we're asking him to do too many things all at once. So moved to have title only. A second from Commissioner Rogers, a motion from Commissioner Willie to read this item by title only. All those in favor, please vote by raising your hand or saying aye. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously five to zero. So we will next turn to Mr. Tom Carr to read this ordinance by title only, please. Thank you, Chair. Ordinance number 884, an ordinance amending chapter 6.04, Animal Services of the Washington County Code to clarify provisions and to comport with changes in state law. And now I made my wrong, there we go. So um, Ms. Angie and Mr. Randy Covey, did you wanna make a brief a staff report today? Randy? It doesn't even have to be brief, an appropriate one, thank you. Thank you, Chair Harrington. Um, and members of the Board of Commissioners, County Administrator Angie um, and Mr. Carr, thank you for making time for me this morning. I'll just, uh, it is just a brief statement as, I, as I've shared with you in the past, it's really difficult to make um, routine um, code revisions really interesting. Um, so um, in the interest of time, I'll just give you this brief uh, uh, summary and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, as I've shared in, in the past, but for members of the public that might be attending today, on February 20th of 2015, a completely rewritten Animal Services Code went into effect. Since that time, Animal Services staff have noted some minor amendments and clarification needs, and there has also been uh, at least one state law change that removes county authority to license animal rescue entities. The issue before your board is a staff-initiated request to amend the ordinance to address these relatively minor and routine, but important issues. The proposed changes will not significantly change the services offered, the authority, the operation or budget of animal services. The proposed changes will help staff provide more clear and consistent information, 
enforcement, and other services related to the Animal Services Code and keep our code consistent with the current state law. The expected result of these changes will be an animal services code that is more clear, more consistent with state law regarding animal rescue entities. Before you today is a request to conduct an introduction and first reading of proposed ordinance number 884 by title only, um, as Mr. Carr has done for us, and uh, continue to November 2nd of this year for the second reading and first public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Covey. And I would like to add for the benefit of our community that the Board of Commissioners had a work session with uh, Mr. Covey and his team back on Tuesday, September 21st. So uh, do feel free to use our iAgenda tool and you can watch that uh, presentation and get the materials right on the county website. So commissioners, do we have a motion to continue uh, consideration of proposed ordinance 884 to November 2nd, 2021 for a second read and first public hearing. We have a motion from Commissioner Rogers, a second from Vice Chair Trees. All those in favor, please vote by raising your hand or saying aye. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously five to zero. Thank you. So Mr. Carr, do we have Courtney available now? Ms. Duke Dreesen is on the line. There she is. And Mr. Greg Wyman is available as well. Thank you staff for your flexibility. Um, uh, we've been asked to take an item off the consent agenda and to bring that forward in action. So I would like to turn it over to our two uh, subject matter experts, uh, in this case right now, Mr. Wyman, uh, to give us, give us a staff presentation on uh, what it is you're asking the board to consider, please. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Harrington and commissioners. For the record, my name is Greg Wyman. I am the real property manager for Washington County. I'd like to present a short staff report on the item, the consent item that was proposed on this morning's agenda. Active management of the real property portfolio is in the best interest of the county and the public. It includes the necessity to disposition surplus property, which is considered a routine matter of business. By its definition, surplus property is property with no use or benefits to its owner, in this case, Washington County. Washington County incurs costs to manage and maintain these properties. There are 11 county owned properties being recommended for disposition by public auction. These properties were acquired through the property tax foreclosure process or by the Department of Land Use and Transportation for various road projects. These properties are no longer needed by the county to further the public interest and are recommended to be declared surplus. The facilities and park services staff prepared an initial list of 15 properties for surplus declaration. These 15 properties were distributed to the county departments, including housing and health and human services, local government agencies and qualifying nonprofits to determine any interest for public or other qualifying use for these properties. The city of Tualatin and West Tualatin Habitat for Humanity have timely indicated interest in a total of four properties. Uh, the city of Tualatin requested one of the properties for use as a park and trailhead. Habitat for Humanity requested three of the properties for use as low income housing projects. Each of these four properties have been removed from the list, included in the agenda package and will come to your board for consideration in a separate agenda. Leaving the balance of the 11 properties before you today for consideration of disposition of surplus property at a public auction. Oregon revised statute requires these properties to be offered at public auction to return the properties to the tax rolls. Each property will be sold to the highest bidder as provided for in the ORS 275. None of these properties recommended for disposition at the public auction are occupied and consist of land only, excepting for one property containing an abandoned single family residence having no value and will likely need to be demolished. The 2019 audit of real property provided recommendations to conduct regular public auctions for disposition of these surplus properties. 
The last public auction was held in 2018. Staff recommends the request for the 11 properties to be declared surplus and authorization for public auction of surplus real property be approved by the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wyman. Uh, Ms. Driesen, Courtney, I didn't get your last name right. I'm sorry. No worries. It's Driesen. Driesen, thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, just available to answer questions about the process if your commission has any. Thank you. Uh, let me start with you, Commissioner Fai. Uh, given your interest in having this uh, staff staff report on this item, do you have any other questions? Uh, thank you, Chair Harrington, um, and thank you, Greg. I feel like I always am coming after your properties. I always seem to have questions about, but um, I thank you. I think you answered all my questions uh, with your presentations. One of the a uh, question that just came to my mind is, um, what are we doing with the, well, I guess I should, okay, I'll just ask, what are we, what's our intention with the money that from these properties? What program are we intending to invest in or are we pulling into the um, general fund? And then I guess the back end of that question is, when we purchase these foreclosure properties, where did that funding come from? So we did not purchase the properties. The foreclosure was just an action taken by the county for non-payment of taxes by the taxpayer on those properties. The land use and transportation properties that were acquired uh, as part of a road project, those were purchased with various funds, either MISTIP or road project funds. The Oregon revised statute requires that when we take money in from an auction, we pay back the entities uh, tax foreclosure, uh, that would be assessment and taxation and land use and transportation for the value that they have in those properties and the monies that were spent on those properties. We also will pay back any maintenance that was done on those properties in the course of the time that the county had those in its portfolio, as well as staff time spent against that. The balance of any residual money taken in from this auction then would go back to the general fund after those payments were made. Commissioner Fye, if I can ex expand on that. The proceeds then fall to the general fund. It is up to the board of commissioners through the annual budget process to determine how the general fund dollars are spent. Thank you. Are there any other commissioner questions or comments? Seeing none, do we have a motion? We have a motion from Commissioner Rogers. Do we have a second from Commissioner Willie? All those in favor of this action, please vote by raising your hand or saying aye. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously five to zero. For our third action item, uh, thank you, Mr. Wyman and Ms. Dreesen for being uh, flexible to be with here with us here. Uh, and now to our land use and transportation team uh, that has been very flexible with us schedule-wise today as well. We have an action item to accept the Urban Road Maintenance District Advisory Committee pedestrian and bicycle recommendations for fiscal year 22, 23, 23, 24, and to amend the existing fiscal year 21, 22 road maintenance program. And it looks like we have the presentation up and all of the staff members with us. Didn't do too badly in stalling time. Welcome everyone. And we'll turn it over to our great subject matter experts. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Harrington and Commissioners. I'm Stephen Roberts, Director of Land Use and Transportation. I'm going to turn things over to Sherry McFall, who's a Programs Coordinator in our Road Operations and Maintenance Division. She's going to walk us through a presentation about a great program and something that we're really excited to bring forward to you. And we also have Todd Watkins, our Operations and Maintenance Division Manager on board. And so Todd and I will be available to help answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Chair Harrington and commissioners. Um, as Director Roberts said, I'm Sherry McFall, Community Programs Coordinator for LUT Operations. Uh, I'm here today with Stephen and Todd to share this year's project selections for the Pedestrian and Biking Improvement Program in the Urban Roads Maintenance District, or ERMD. Slide, please. Thank you. This program targets pedestrian and bicycle solutions for specific needs at the neighborhood level. Here we see a great example of a neighborhood need for a crossing. Slide, please. The project selection process includes robust and extensive public involvement all along the way. A candidate is created by one or more community members requesting a specific pedestrian or biking improvement. Candidates within the ERM are, ERMD are eligible for the program, and this year there were 157 candidates. I want to thank all the community members who requested improvements, noting that I spoke personally with many of them. <laughs> ERMD Act reviews all the candidates this year, all 157 of them, biennially, bi -en biennially, and identifies which ones to advance for consideration and public comment. There is then a month-long initiative to engage communities throughout the county via our website, social media, and other communication means. You can see one of these images here is our uh, bilingual slide in Spanish asking for public comment on all of the candidates. Next slide, please. These improvement project selections are made by ERMDAC, the Urban Roads Maintenance District Advisory Committee. I believe there are some committees, committee members in attendance today. And this is truly the flagship activity of ERMDAC. This is a photo of the committee members as well as the 2021 program schedule. Having facilitated most of these meetings, I must say I am deeply impressed with ERMDAC's commitment to vetting these considerations, excuse me, these candidates and making selections that meet the needs of our communities countywide. Slide please. Due to the extensive nature of the selection process and the length of time to develop, design, bid, and construct the projects, we use a biennial schedule, as I mentioned earlier. The program was changed to biennial from annual in 2017. Today's projects that you're looking at today will extend two fiscal years beyond this current fiscal year. In each selection year, $1 million is set aside in the earned budget to begin the design phase on the projects. That's the reason that we are also at this time asking you to amend the road maintenance program. That money is already set aside in the budget, but needs to be assigned specifically to these projects in the work program if you accept them. Slide, please. Here we illustrate typical project timelines. Though some of these are small projects, schedules can be extremely complex. We are shoehorning these improvements into existing facilities. These can be dramatic enhancements for neighborhoods. This complexity of schedule is the reason why we transition to a biennial process. Slide, please. Here's a great example of a past project. We can see a narrow goat trail along the fence on this segment of Johnson Street next to a ditch. Um, transition, please. After improvements, we now have a nice new sidewalk with improved drainage. Slide, please. Here's another great example. This is along Taylor's Ferry, a very popular transit route. Very narrow shoulder where no one can walk or ride. You can see the bus coming right there with all the traffic behind it. Now there's a sidewalk, bike lane, and drainage. We call these projects pedestrian and biking improvements, but sometimes they could be much better described as drainage projects with a sidewalk or a bike lane attached. Much of the focus and funding are spent improving drainage to even allow the enhancement to be built. In fact, this is a good time to recognize Clean Water Services, who we saw much earlier in the meeting today. 
for the work they do in implementing these solutions with us. They are a terrific partner. Slide, please. This begins the list of selections made by ERMDAC this year. Pedestrian crossings outnumber sidewalks this year for the first time. Sidewalks, however, do make up 75% of the total cost estimate. Slide, please. And these are the rest of the selections. Slide. This map is intended to give an idea of the geographic dispersion of the pro projects. It's been included as a full page map in your packet for you to see in detail. So we've looked at some successful completed projects from previous years. Now let's look at photos of some of this year's project locations. Slide please. This is Huntington Avenue, looking at the traffic signal at Cedar Hills Boulevard. Just past the signal is William Walker Elementary School. Young children walk along this street to and from school every day. They have to walk along the edge of the street. When they pass one of these parked cars, they have to walk into the street. And if you look there on the right-hand side, you can see they also have to pass multiple business entries. The need for improvement here is clear and ERMDAC has selected this location for sidewalks. Slide please. This is Kaiser Road with the opening for 147th Avenue to the left. There's a community park on the Northeast corner of 147th. To the right, we, where we see cyclists crossing this, waiting to cross this busy road is a path that's very popular that comes out of the neighborhood. ERMDAC has selected this location for a pedestrian crossing. Slide please. In this photo, we're looking northbound on, one, on 185th Avenue. 185th is a five lane urban arterial and very popular transit route. You can see Pheasant Lane on the right just before the transit stop and the street light. Another transit stop is located on the left side headed southbound just outside of the photo. Can you imagine trying to cross this road after getting off of the bus trying to get home? ERMDAC has selected this location for a pedestrian crossing. In fact, this location will have a half signal which will stop traffic. All of ERMDAC selections will help folks get home safely to their neighborhoods. When these projects are completed, we hope they make a positive impact on the communities and improve the quality of life for those that we serve. Next slide. Here is my contact information and that of my manager in case you have any follow-up questions after the meeting. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you, Sherry. Commissioners, any uh, questions or comments on this list of recommendations and or a motion to approve the resolution and order? Go ahead, Commissioner Willie. I, I think this is a great example of uh, why these um, road districts are, are created. Um, I mean, the process that went through for the selection of these projects, thank you very much, uh, Sherry, for your hard work on these. Um, and I think it's just a perfect example of why this is. It's the same thing with the Rural Roads uh, Group. Uh, I so enjoy uh, their insights and all their focus on rural roads. So yeah, I, I move, uh, we approve this list of projects. Uh, there's a second from Commissioner Rogers. So we now have a motion to accept the list of recommended bicycle and pedestrian improvement projects from the Urban Road Maintenance District Advisory Committee, as well as the motion to approve the resolution and order adopting the proposed amendments for the fiscal year 21-22 annual road maintenance program. Are there any other commissioner comments before I make mine? Okay, so I'll make some comments and then uh, we'll have the vote. I wanna thank the uh, members of the Urban Road Maintenance 
advisory committee. Some of them joined us in the meeting this morning, uh, but we basically wore them out uh, in our considerations for other agenda items. I know I saw uh, Melissa Laird on the call. I, I may have seen Ray Eck. He usually makes an effort uh, to attend when we adopt such things. Uh, but all the members, as they are pictured on the fourth slide of the presentation or the fourth page, thank you very much. I know you work with Sherry, Todd, and other members of the team to evaluate all kinds of projects. Uh, and to my fellow colleagues, Commissioner Treese and Commissioner Fai, these projects are first and foremost in your local districts, in my district, sure. But when, when constituents have questions, they usually call you first. Uh, and I know that each and every one, each of you follow up on those com constituent questions and really work side by side with our land use and transportation team to ensure that our community members know that we hear their requests and their interest and that we are trying to improve, in my words, connectivity in our communities so that you can get safely and comfortably to your destination, no matter how you're trying to get there. So I too will be approving uh, these actions today. Go ahead, Commissioner Treese. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, remind the commission that I sit on ERM deck, but as a non-voting member, because these recommendations come here for, for my vote, but the, uh, the degree of interchange, the degree of uh, discussion is really enlightening. And I've appreciated the, the limited time I've been able to spend with ERMDAC and I look forward to future meetings, but they do work hard. So thank you and a great presentation, Sherry. Thank you. Yes, I enjoyed uh, seeing the various examples because I have, I have lived in uh, various areas over these last 31 years for these improvements and they are much needed. And we would do more if we had more transportation funding, but we're, we're using good due diligence to put the funding that we do have into highest and best use. So, and with that, commissioners, all those in favor of the actions of this motion, please raise your hand or say aye. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? Thank you, commissioners. The motion passes unanimously five to zero. Let's see, Commissioner Five, we were able to get all three action items in. All righty. Uh, so next on our agenda, thank you, staff members, is our second public comment period. Clerk Moss, there you are. Do we have anyone who wishes to speak with us at this stage? Uh -huh. We have no one that signed up, Madam Chair, and I'm not seeing anyone in the attendees wishing to testify at either. No raised hands. Okay. Well, with that, then the next item on our agenda is board uh, communications, and I'll kick it off with this week. We have two more days of clean water services training uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, October 21st, and Thursday. Uh, following. Then next week, we'll have a work session in the afternoon and then an evening board meeting, which will start at 6.30 p.m. Ah, yes. And then we're into the month of November already. Tuesday, November 2nd, we'll have a work session that starts in the morning, followed by our monthly Housing Authority board meeting at 10 a.m., and then our board meeting will follow on right after that, approximately 10.30, but it's agenda specific. And then we'll reconvene in our work session later in the day. Thursday, November 4th, we have a round table that starts at 9 a.m. Then we have another set of meetings on Tuesday, November 9th. Vice Chair Trees, just to make sure you know, I will be Zooming in uh, from out of state so uh, just in case uh, at my vacation place, I have uh, limited Wi-Fi. If you could please run that meeting, I'd really appreciate it. And I will participate. 
So work session at 8.30, board meeting starts at 10. Then the following two weeks after that, Tuesday, November 16, and Tuesday, November 23rd, we will not be meeting as a board. But during the week of the 16th, or the 15th, really, uh, the annual Association of Oregon Counties Conference uh, will be taking place, and a few of us are planning to attend that in Eugene. We will have a set of meetings the last Tuesday of the month, the Tuesday after our holiday weekend. That will be November 30th. We'll have a work session in the afternoon at 2, followed by an evening board meeting. Can't believe it'll be the end of November already. Yikes. Are there any last board communications for today's meeting? All right. Seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? Motion from Commissioner Trees. Do we have a second? Second from Commissioner Fai. All those in favor of adjourning today's meeting, please vote by saying aye or raising your hands. Thank you, commissioners. And he opposed. The motion carries unanimously five to zero. That's it for today, Tuesday, October 19th. Thank you very much, commissioners. We're all done for the day. Bye-bye.